Oh, okay. Now we'll go in March. Adam Curry, John C. Devorak. It's Sunday, December 23rd, 2018. This is your award-winning Gibbo Nation Media Assassination, episode 1097. This is No Agenda. Beating the Zephyr and broadcasting live from the capital of the drone, Star State, here in downtown Austin, Tejas, in the Cludio. In the morning, everybody. I'm Adam Curry. And from northern Silicon Valley, where I just witnessed the 12-car coastal. Late by an hour going by. I'm John C. Dvorak. It's Craig Vaughn and Buzzkill. In the morning. I don't typically do New Year's resolutions. But I think we should resolve to stop with the Zephyr stuff in 2019. It's not a we issue. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was just trying to make it a show You're issue. You're trying to make it magnanimous. <laughs> a show You're trying issue. To trick me. A, a show issue. <laughs> You're trying to trick me. <laughs> you know, I, I just have this vision of you sitting in, up there in your office on the hill, watching the trains go by. It goes one now. Marking it down in your little notebook. I definitely had a little notebook. Calling and I in, it into the calling in com- headquarters every <laughs> once in a while. Calling in complaints. It was late. You know, I used to call in complaints because there's some clown some years back. Maybe we're talking some years back, who would love coming through with their freight trains. Honking the horn as loud as they can, but there's no crossings. There's nothing. Honking and honking at three in the morning, thinking that's hilarious. It's classic. <laughs> of course, I'd be doing the same thing if I was bored. Yeah, in- yeah. Or- Austin has that too. We have the the trains coming through, and they always are blowing their horn. Yeah, on purpose, of course. Yeah, especially at three in the morning. There's no reason for it. Today is an important day, December twenty third, two thousand eighteen. Not that you know it. Uh, but there's an important election taking place today, which kind of fits in with my beat. Look, well, then it's your beat to, to discuss. I'm going to discuss it with a quick three clip, a three parter clip series, because it makes nothing but sense. Uh, what have I been tracking? I've been tracking Ebola in the Democratic Republic Ebola. of the Congo. <laughs> And typically when there's Ebola, the whole idea is to send in some military troops to keep everything peaceful and calm, which may have a secondary reason. Uh, We learned recently that the actual area of north, was it Viku, Biku, Niku, Viku? I forget already what it was. Uh, A particular area of uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo is where pretty much all your cell phone materials comes from. There's diamonds, there's gold, there's also a lot of oil, and there's an election that's been gearing up. And whenever there's elections, we always want to be involved. And I have a feeling that maybe the Ebola stories is to just get us ready in case we have to jump in and do something, because there's a big problem with these elections, again, slated for today in the DRC. This is the infamous voting machine, a touchscreen on which voters will select their candidate for the election before a ballot is printed and put into a ballot box to be counted manually. The president of the Electoral Commission claims that this machine will make voting easier for the population and at the same time guarantee total transparency. The ballot boxes should tell the truth. We want the winner to win. The best of them all must succeed. The machine is here to annihilate all attempts at cheating, which we unfortunately witnessed in the 2011 and 2006 elections. This is what the machine is here to fix. At the Electoral Commission headquarters, as in several places in Kinshasa, voting machines are displayed so that anybody can come and experiment with the new technology. Now that I've tried it, it looks very easy to me. But the question is now, will the uneducated people, like our mothers in the villages, know how to use the machine? (laughs) With the poll fast approaching, some opposition leaders are still very unhappy about the use of the machines, which they call cheating machines. Ah, the machine... Uh, The voting machines are not a reliable way to vote. Congolese people are not used to it. It does not exist in our electoral law either. The Kabila clan shows this way of voting so that they can cheat. So there seems to be some issue with these new voting machines that have ever been brought in, manufactured by Miru Systems, a fine South Korean firm, which... Leads me to believe there might be some Chinese stuff in there. But also, if you have an Ebola-infested country and area 
Why are you going to have touch screens? That seems like exactly the opposite of what you'd want to do. And, exactly. and Nikki Haley uh, at the U.N. had her own issues. We are deeply concerned by the Election Commission's insistence on using an electronic voting system that has never been used in the DRC. Our understanding is that the commission has never even tested this electronic voting system in the DRC, but plans to deploy this technology for the first time on Election Day. It should go without saying that employing an unfamiliar technology for the first time during a crucial election is an enormous risk. Mm -hmm. It has the potential to seriously undermine the credibility of elections that so many have worked hard to see have happen. These elections must see be held happen. by paper mm -hmm. ballots, so there is no question by the Congolese people about the results. The U.S. has no appetite to support an electronic voting system. Except here, of course. <laughs> Except here. Wow. And, and if, uh, if they were you made... That. That's your ISO. Yeah, you're right. It is an ISO. Uh, if it was made by Diebold, maybe she would have been okay with it. But perhaps the fact that it comes from South Korea and could have some Chinese technology in there, who, of course, would like to have some control over the country, seeing as they're the ones in there getting all the minerals... So what do you do? Well, you do this, of course. The first pictures of a burning election commission warehouse in Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Inside were voting materials destined for centres throughout the city ahead of presidential elections on December 23rd. It started at about 2 o'clock in the morning local time. An estimated 7,000 voting machines were destroyed. <laughs> You can't make it up. <laughs> so I not sh I can't take it much further than this. I don't know uh, who's behind it, but certainly we're not happy with the uh, with the voting machines and uh that may have something to do with the outcome and who ultimately is in control. I think we have no control over this one. Uh we're just we're just blowing in the wind. Well, you don't know that. Well, that's that's why I always say the Ebola may be there. So if the wrong person gets elected, which could happen, um, you know, then we well, can no, send in. It will happen. Then we can. By our standards. <laughs> yes. Then we can send in uh, some troops to uh, protect everyone from Ebola. So it could be a yeah. distraction. So because there's nothing in the news that I've seen. I mean, I had to go to um, Al Jazeera. Where else did I, I mean? No U.S. outlets of any significance are reporting on even on the election, really. And certainly well, not about the, de Definitely can't have Nikki Haley saying that voting machines are no good. <laughs> <laughs> there you go it's good enough for us but not for you in the drc shut up and give me some minerals for my cell phone yes well we obviously will keep track this is not gonna it sounds to me that this borderline you know mess it's, it's a mess it is a not mess borderline. yeah it, it's an actual mess uh, well, good. I'm glad you caught that. Yeah. So that so the election is today. So who knows? Maybe Ebola will step up today, depending on the outcome. I don't think it we double. Have, I don't think we have an outcome just yet. Uh, but I'll keep an eye on it. So uh, I've but I, I've considered one of my beats to be the uh, Supreme Court Justice picks. Ooh, yes. Uh, you mean because you're already counting on uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg no longer uh, serving as a justice? My mother had cancer, and she lived to 90, and she probably had cancer for, I don't know, a long time, like maybe a yeah, decade. Well, my mother had lung cancer. didn't, didn't <laughs> well, last didn't a long time. Cancer, she had just some, something. Oh, okay. But she was so skinny that the cancer couldn't thrive. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. And uh, that's what kept her going. Hmm. It's like nothing like a cabbage diet. <laughs> anyway, the... Uh, Ruth Gator, uh, Ruth Gator, Ruth <laughs> Bader Ginsburg it, it seems to have that same characteristic. She's really thin. If she had a blood transfusion or something, she'd be a, she'd be a goner. Hmm. Um, but you know, still, she's this is like she's had lots of different cancers. She's like not just someone who's had has some lingering cancer. So I figure she's got a year. It, it, well, she just being old and tired. How about that? I mean, I. You may want to serve your country, but she's, I believe, 85. Well, she, yeah, but she's a, you know, diehard liberal. I don't want to get replaced. But, 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 let me just Trump say one thing. Be before she dies, because eventually we all do, 
there's a lot of good to be said about her. I mean, she she did do a lot for women. She's very, very interesting. You know, she's an important part of the American experience. Let me say it before she's gone. Um, good for you. So, so, you know, to say, you know, it's easy to say, ah, she falls asleep, she's no good. But she has quite I a never history. never said that. No, I'm, but, say, but, I'm saying it in general, not about you, in general. Because yeah. I hear a lot of this. I read a lot of this. Yeah, give, the, give the woman a little bit of respect as she leaves. Meanwhile, we've got to pick somebody. I do have an essay coming up. I've decided from now on, now on out, I'm not putting it in the newsletter. I'm sending them out separately. Mm-hmm. Um, this will be uh, handicapping the picks. I'll give you a little heads up. I do not think Amy Comey, Coney Barrett is going to win anything or get picked. Really? Uh, I think the, they're going to probably pick a pick a pick a, pook a, pack a, pick a woman. <laughs> yeah. And I believe it will be uh, her c- competition, uh, which is Joan Larson. Uh huh. Now, Joan Larson and Kukomi Berry is the odds on absolute. If you want to have check boxes, she is the smartest. She is the prettiest. She's the youngest. <laughs> oh, hold on, Joan Larson. I don't. I've never even heard no, of no. her. No, no. Amy Comey Barrett is the smartest, the oh, prettiest, oh, the, oh. the 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 youngest. Comey Barrett's a few years older. Mm-hmm. I'm not sorry. Larson's a few years older. Comey Barrett is the youngest. The problem with Comey Barrett, I believe, is in her presentation. We talk about you know if on paper. You, I'm reminded of our vice president, hopeful under the John McCain administration, who I had picked to be picked. Um, our friend from Alaska. Yeah, Sarah Palin. She, I, I picked her not ever hearing her. Uh, ah, her, yes, yes. Rah, and, rah, and, and, rah, and, and, you know, and we, and we do need to be very specific here. The American public chooses their elected leaders like we choose our soap. So it needs to be appealing. The message needs to be repeated clearly and often. You will be much whiter after you use me. Now, Comey Coney Barrett has the uh, advantages of being the smartest. She's got great education. She's got great credit. She has seven children, two of them. She's adopted two kids from Haiti, Haiti refugee. She's a, she's a saint. <laughs> What's wrong with her then, John? There's got to be something wrong. Her voice. Ah. Uh. Her voice, she sounds like she's on helium. I have a clip. I want you to play. I have to tell everybody because they know that we have doctored our clips occasionally for for a cheap laugh, <laughs> not to change the meaning or anything. There is no doctoring going on with this clip. Uh, and I think just because she doesn't pres- – her, and she's a professor, but she uh, her voice is a bit uh, off-putting. When is it proper for a judge to put their religious views above applying the law? Thank you, Chairman Grassley. Um, let me start with your very last question and say never. Wow. It's never appropriate for a judge to impose that judge's personal convictions, whether they derive from faith or anywhere else on the law. Um, this article that I wrote as a law student has gotten a lot of attention since my nomination, so I'd like the opportunity to put it in context. Um, I wrote that Law Review article when I was a third-year law student with one of my professors 20 years ago. It was a project that he had underway and he invited me to work on it with him. And I was complimented that as a student, he thought I was up to the task of being more than a research assistant. Um, But I was very much the junior partner in our collaboration, and that was appropriate given our relative statures. Um, Would I or could I say that sitting here today that that article in its every particular reflects how I think about these questions today with, as you say, the benefit of 20 years of experience and also the ability to speak solely in my own voice? <laughs> no, it would not. Ironically. It, it doesn't seem that. I mean, I, I, I get what you're going for, but the competition has got to be a lot better for this to be a, a total uh, game, you know, a, a non-starter. It's, it's Joan a- Larson, I ha- think, has the creds to be able to pull this off. She's got a little more experience on the bench. She's got more experience as a litigator. She's got more experience in general. But again, not quite the voice you want for someone who – and not that I'm going to be picky about this, but I know you know these things do matter. Uh, also, there was a fear that Amy uh, Coney Barrett 
has not enough judicial experience. She's only been on the bench for since 2017, along with Joan. But Joan was a was a uh, chief justice mm -hmm. before she got on the bench uh, at one of the states, I think Michigan. And so she was on the Supreme Court. Um, the problem they believe is that Barrett, they don't know if, if she's going to become another David Souter who was a big, you know, big conservative pick by one of the uh, one of the conservative presidents and turned out to be this massive liberal. Uh, co <laughs> Barrett could be the same way. She mm -hmm. could become a Matt. You could just see it in her way. She thinks that she could become a real killer liberal. That would be a problem. So they, they're not picking her. I'm just telling everybody. I love I love your mind reading. I'm not now, saying it's wrong. Joan Larson is, is I think, a better choice uh, not the voice i'd want to hear <laughs> but at least she uh um, can i can i it, give you a quick quick feedback just because i'd not even heard this name prior to this program yeah if we were to cast a female uh justice she's the one she is so you're looking at the, okay, larson well, is straight a, uh, out of central casting okay let's stop there i mean i will make a commentary about this because uh, adam and i both have thoughts about appearance <laughs> Uh, from the executive producer perspective, yes, not from you know. Amy dudes. is is prettier, and Amy is uh, incredibly telegenic. Joan is beautiful in a photograph, but she is not nearly as telegenic. She's actually not telegenic. Mm -hmm. So there's a little difference there, but it's beside the point. They're Supreme Court justices. Not they're going to be. They're they're never on camera. So what difference does it make? So let's listen to her. Branches, but not be to those branches. As I said in the Supreme Court hearing, judges must be equally dependent, independent of the president who nominates them and the senators who confirm them. Um, so, Justice Larson. I think your voice is really quite masculine. <laughs> please describe <laughs> what judicial independence means to you and tell us whether you have any trouble ruling against the president who appointed you. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Chairman Grassley. Uh, I would have absolutely no trouble ruling against the president who appointed me um, or any successor president as well. Uh, judicial independence means one thing, one very simple thing, and that is putting the law above everything else, the statutes passed by this body and the Constitution of the United States. Uh, so I would have absolutely no trouble, and indeed that would be my duty. Yeah. We've often heard these words, uh, especially since January, quote, unquote, now more than ever, we need judges who will be independent of the president who nominated them. So I'd like to ask about your nomination and your independence. A lot or uh, much. Now, was this a confirmation hearing for a uh, for for this for the circuit court circuits? Yeah. 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 For the, the circuit. Um also, uh, Barrett uh, got less votes in the Senate as a confirmation than Larson did. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's a, a they hate her because she's a staunch Catholic. The other problem is I'm going to bring this. This is the part that that nobody will discuss because it's like you can't discuss it. The Supreme Court has too many Catholics on it. Hmm. It's almost all Catholics and, and a couple of Jews. That's it. Amy Comey, Coney Barrett is an extreme Catholic. She's like a, I would say she's a charismatic Catholic in the old sense. This woman, Larson, I spent days trying to find out what religion or what religious affiliation she has. There is none. Hmm. She's either an atheist, an agnostic, <clears throat> a Wicca, <laughs> or who knows what. <laughs> a Wicca. <laughs> She, yeah, that's what she looks like. Nailed it. <laughs> now, and believe me, I did put a little, little more effort than I should have because I, I, at one point I got, I said, wait a minute, I've got to figure this out. And I went and found all kinds of documentation for what the religious affiliations are of all these different people. And uh, she's, she's not definable. I've even written to people who wrote some biographies about her and no, nobody ever wrote me back. Thank you. Um, so that's an issue because it may turn out that she's, you know, I don't believe in God or she's I mean, <clears throat> atheist is what because if you she has a husband, this is a problem. She's got some drawbacks. She's got a husband who's a professor of law 
this guy is got the goatee, the black scraggly goatee, not a nice trim goatee, just scraggly goatee, a big ponytail. Oh, no. Yeah, ponytail. And he wears a bow tie all the time. <laughs> what does he do? <laughs> he's a professor of law, and he teaches, teaches uh -huh. law. Uh-huh. And he's got the bow tie and the ponytail and the spinning, you know, the whole, I mean, it's, just, uh, it's like this guy is, and they do, they do not share names. She, so she's of the, of the, which is a giveaway of some sort. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking my husband's name. I probably won't be married to him that long. Why should I? Or something like that. Uh, Amy Coney Barrett uh, is married to about Barrett and Coney is her old last old name. Uh -huh. Um, so there's that. So there we have this a problem. And there's a third party, which I, who I don't have in handy. I've done doing some research on him. who's was another a possible guy, but I think <clears> they're going to have to put a woman in because of Ginsburg being a woman. So it's got to be what it's got to be one of these two. There's no other real challengers. These are the two best. Okay. Well, um, just based on, uh, what I'm seeing, I think I had not heard of Joan Larson even being in the, in the race for this. I hadn't even honestly considered uh, uh, talking about a replacement for Ginsburg just yet. Yeah, well, you got to be ahead of the game. But, <laughs> but yeah, but Larson, you know, you could put her on Law and Order right now. Boom, in there, done. <coughs> she looks the part, and yeah, I she and I, th I think she that I think that's part. that'll do it. On, um, and then we'll, we'll yeah. see. Okay. Well, while we're on that, then. Uh, we saw General Mattis uh, resign. Yes, as, I have a bunch uh, of clips about that. Yeah, you want to just talk about his replacement real quick? Do you have any any thoughts on yeah, it? I do. I have I have the military's thoughts. You know, well, the, I've looked at uh, Stars and Stripes and the uh, Military Times and looked at what they thought. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I think the guy, the best guy would be the guy who's a, a deputy, the guy who was the uh, executive from Boeing. Right. Who's the deputy. Well, that's the guy you want. You want that kind of guy because he keeps the whole thing moving. And, you know, as you can see, well, maybe we should take a step back before we get to that. What happened, the minute Trump said, all right, pulling out of Syria, pulling out of Afghanistan, everybody in Washington, D.C. just lost their crap, including Fox, and maybe even especially Fox News. He said, oh, my God, what are we going to do? This, this is the machine. You can't, you can't remove the machine. This is not how it works. You can't remove the machine. And uh, I have a couple funny clips about it. Do you want to start with something? I have a bunch of clips I got Panetta bitching about. Oh, good, good, good. Let's do, let's do some bitching first. Why don't I start with bitch number one. Yeah, this is, this is actually Fox. This is, I think, Fox and Friends and... Uh, Sarah Sanders, of course, calls in. The president me, has been... It, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say one thing. Uh, that was in a tweet somebody pointed this on. I thought it was great. Says, Trump has done nothing to change the Republican Party, but he's done everything to change the Democrat Party. They are now all warmongers. Yeah, <laughs> that's what's... Well, okay, then I'll flip them around. Yes, warmongers. So we'll start with Nicole Wallace uh, from MSNBC. Um, here's what she had to say. I mean, is, is he someone, is, is the Pentagon, I mean, you're basically describing a U.S. military that does not listen to the commander-in-chief. Is that what's going on? Well, no, I don't think that they don't listen to him. I think that they, they uh, try yeah, the to prepare transgender for the unexpected. Ban. He ordered a transgender ban. I, I, listen, to their credit, I'm cheered if you're telling me that the military doesn't listen to him. But I read a lot of quotes <laughs> of a cheered. lot of senior Pentagon officials who were alarmed by the news, who had the rug pulled, who were uh, uh, testified but, but, or, or committed communicated as recently as yesterday yeah. that our commitment was solid the president seems to have his foreign policy run through moscow or <laughs> turkey or other countries yeah so she is just cheered she's cheered i don't know if you can be cheered but she's cheered if uh, the military no longer listens to the commander-in-chief that's uh, she's cheered by that so i guess she likes that and then we have uh, the Fox people just taking it many steps further. The president has been talking about this since the campaign. He brought it up again eight months ago, six months ago. He's wanted to bring our troops home. Yeah. Look, our goal and the president's purpose of continuing to be in Syria was to defeat ISIS. We've defeated the territorial caliphate. Ninety-nine percent of ISIS has been wiped out of Syria. The president doesn't want to be in the middle of another civil war in the Middle East and put American right. lives on the line for that purpose. He 
wants to bring the men and women of our armed forces home, and that's what he Sarah, pledged to do, and that's exactly what he's doing. Sarah, he's giving Russia a big win. Vladimir Putin praised him. He also is doing exactly what he criticized President Obama for doing. He said President Obama is the founder of ISIS. He just refounded ISIS because he got 30,000 <laughs> men there, and they're <laughs> already striking back. He refounded ISIS. <laughs> This is fantastic. Everyone wants war, apparently, in the, in the mainstream media. Everybody, all sides. War, 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 war. We just want war. I don't care. We, just, we need to be fighting somewhere. This is no good. And if you... But, go ahead. It's just ridiculous. And, and just to, as for historical context, when Mattis was brought in to uh, manage the uh, Afghanistan region under... Well, that was under Bush. Uh, Rumsfeld was the uh, Secretary of Defense. When he came in, he was hated, hated by the left. At, and mainly because this is a news clip from Al Jazeera. I'll just play a little bit from, um, this must have been around that, a little bit later than two th maybe 2006 or something. This is the man who will take over one of the U.S. military's most challenging jobs, General James Mattis. And this is what he's best known for. That kid's a lot of fun to fight him, you know. It's a hell of a hoot. Uh, it, it's fun to shoot some people. I'll be right up on you. I like brawling. In announcing his choice of Mattis. <laughs> he's like, I like to shoot him. I love him. Oh, yeah, I like to get in a brawl and shoot those guys. I don't get you know, It's like, hey, they, they uh, mishandle women, so uh, it's good to go kill them. It was not really what anyone wanted to hear at the time. At least <laughs> not on the, uh, on the uh, left no one really. But now he's a big. But hero. now, yeah, now we forget all that. We're very good at it. We forget all about the a hole who wanted to just go blow people up, and and now. Oh. I also heard that this is a story that I heard is that Mattis had consultants in who were saying, you know, you could run for president in 2020. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And so part of the issue. Was I think it, a lot of true four star generals would all kind of believe that maybe because Ike did it. Right. Well, apparently he had the consultants in. Uh, the president got wind of it. And he's like, you know, if you want to want, if you want to run, that's cool. But I can't have you in for two years while you're ultimately going to run against me. So you got to go. That's that's the story I heard from our military intelligence. That actually makes sense. But I think it's a combination of things. Sure. I think other it's issues. perfect timing, of course, you know, with, with the pullout in Syria. Perfect timing. Well, one, of course, he wanted to stay in Syria forever. There's also the issue with the chief of staff. Um, he didn't like Mark Miley, the guy that we like, head of the, the Army, taking over as uh, chief of staff of the Joint Chiefs. He wanted David Goldfein, who's the Air Force guy, and I would challenge anybody in the military or civilians, or whatever, take go on the Wikipedia and look up Miley and look up Goldfein and put their bios side by side and ask yourself why anybody would want Goldfein. Mm. Uh, so there was that there was that issue. There was the Miley issue. And there's a third issue. I'm trying to think what it was that he had a run in with. Uh, I mean, Mattis was in, dis in total disagreement. I'll come up with it before we're done with our clips. But. It wasn't a good match to begin with. But let's play the, the kind of the backgrounder on Mattis quits, leaves snarky note, PBS. The resignation letter was noteworthy for its absence of any praise for President Trump. Instead, he cited his differences with the commander in chief, writing, you have the right to have a secretary whose views are better aligned with yours. We are going to appoint Mad Dog Mattis as our Secretary of Defense. The seeds of discord were present when Mr. Trump announced in 2016 that the retired four-star Marine General would run the Pentagon. Mattis has made it known that he hates the nickname Mad Dog. After that, he repeatedly disagreed publicly with the president by supporting NATO and other alliances, criticizing Russian interference in U.S. elections, and opposing the president's withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal and transgender military ban. Then came Mr. Trump's sudden decision this week to withdraw U.S. troops from Syria, a move Mattis strongly disagreed with. 
At the White House last night, Press Secretary Sarah Sanders acknowledged the rift. Um, he and the president have a good relationship, but sometimes they disagree. Uh, the president always listens to the members of his national security team, but at the end of the day, it's the president's decision to make. Mattis plans to leave the Pentagon at the end of February. Hmm. The other uh, little issue I was thinking about besides the uh, Mark Miley and all these other disagreements is the Pentagon budget failed. They tried you mean to, the audit? You know, the audit failed. Audit? Yes, the yes. audit. He's failed. the head of <laughs> the Defense Department. He's the head of the Pentagon. He's the one responsible. He's the one who didn't get the audit done. Right. Yeah, another, another good point. And nobody's talking about that. Well, nobody wants to know about it, including this president. I don't think he really cares. He just wants to make sure we spend a lot on it and that we're the biggest and the baddest. So here's uh, here we have – PBS had a lot of this because Judy has gone off the rails. <laughs> I really th- think that she misses uh, Gwen, Gwen to yeah. an extreme. Gwen's balance. She, I miss Gwen's balance. She's got no. She's completely unbalanced. She's she's starting to shake. She's she's really Trump hater. It's unbelievable. So we have these. Uh, we have Panetta and Richard Haas. So Panetta, former ch- CIA director, former Secretary of Defense for Obama. Yes, and Haas was all- Haas Secret- is the, is has been a lot of different things, but he's the head of the Council on Foreign Relations. Ah, so we have right, a real right. balance. Here. Yeah, <laughs> these these are the guys you want for a balanced story on PBS. So let's listen to Panetta on Mattis. Leon Panetta, to you first. Your reaction when you learned that uh, Secretary Mattis had resigned? I I thought it was a sad day for the nation uh, to lose uh, an outstanding defense secretary uh, who was well experienced uh, with regards to national security policy and also believed in the basic principles uh, of of leadership, of strength, uh, of our alliances, uh, of understanding who our adversaries are, uh, principles that I think have served this country well since World War II. To lose that experience, to lose somebody with those principles, I think uh, increases the danger in this country of not having the ability to deal with a lot of danger points in the world today. And that that concerns me because I think it puts our nation at risk. So what did he just say other than uh, 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 orange man bad? What did he nothing. actually say? Okay, nothing. I but thought here's it was what me. goes with the follow-up. That she goes to Haas and asks him specifically, do you think the nation's at risk, and which is what Panetta said, we're all at risk some, for some reason. She thinks so too. You can tell the way she asked the question. Listen to Haas not answer this question in any affirmative way. Richard Haas, you agree it puts the nation at risk? Well, it's certainly a major loss. Uh, He was experienced. He was sober. (laughs) He represented... Sober? Hey, we want our military men drunk. He was sober. He represented essentially a traditional foreign policy view for a foreign policy... I'll admit my bias. I think it served this country extraordinarily well for three quarters of a century. Hmm. Yeah. He didn't say anything. There's nothing that risk. Things are just changing. In fact, he goes on and discusses this a little bit more. This is uh, Haas now discussing the Trump pullout of Syria, uh, which is like, again, we're listening to the head of the Council on Foreign Relations. So he's. You know, definitely. Let me uh, guess. The guy he, mu- he must be against it. <laughs> or am well, I wrong? Everyone's against it. Everyone's oh, against it. Just check And here's what gets me. Why why were we doing there in the first place? But he pulls the same stunt that these other guys have pulled. We did it on the last show. I had a clip that was similar to this, where this is some sort of a uh, abnegation of our, our responsibility when we're not even supposed to be in Syria. It was only going to be a temporary thing to begin with. Three months. It, it, Three months. Three months. In and out. Has yeah, again. In and out. But here, listen to him go on and on. Has again what I think is a, a radical view of this country's relationship with the world. And that will be heard you know, far beyond the Middle East. I would think people in, in Taiwan, in South Korea, in Europe, they saw what this president did. And why would any American ally, why would any country dependent on America somehow believe that something like this couldn't happen to them? We have shredded our reputation for reliability and dependability. And that might be the, the greatest consequence of the last few days. What's interesting about this. 
go ahead. Yeah, go I'm ahead. Just saying, what is he talking about? We who what ally did we screw? No, by what, leaving Syria. No, but he's name one. Well, that's not what he's saying. I think to me, what he's saying is, hey, if you're Japan, you know, you should be worried because you know we can just pull right out and we won't even have a base. We won't protect you. I think that's what he's trying to say. We only have 800 bases around the world, so you know. Uh, I, I personally, I like it. I've been advocating to get out of everything for as long as I can remember. And also, there's there was no. Uh, this is all under the phony baloney. Although it wasn't at the time, but under the 9-11 uh, regulation of the president, you know, we're under, still under a state of emergency. Presidents can put us into war situations without the only body who has the authority to do that, which is the House of Representatives. Well, I know someone that agrees with you. Uh, well, there's a lot of people who would agree with me. <laughs> well, <laughs> who, who and, and, and so far as the clip. <laughs> oh, Ron Paul, of course. Yes. You know, in a way, why should it be complicated? We were in a place we shouldn't have been in. It's a war that's unconstitutional, doesn't make any sense. We don't know why we're there. We don't know when we're supposed to come home. And finally, we have a president, in this case, doing exactly what he said he wants to do. And they go nuts. So um, I guess we shouldn't be shocked, shocked, I'm shocked, <laughs> that, that there would be these factions. But- yeah, and I think, you know, this is, you know, Washington showing its colors. Here are the neocons, the main proponents of the unitary executive. He's the decider. He's the commander in chief. Then when he finally acts as a decider, acts as a commander in chief in a constitutional way, removing troops from somewhere they shouldn't go, all of a sudden, he didn't tell us. He didn't ask us. He's not listening to us. What's going on here? The war is a dumb war, and it's unconstitutional. And then they criticize him for doing it. This is this is one place where uh, a president that has a, even a memory of the Constitution did the right thing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's also a nice time to pay attention to the people who are adamantly against this uh, pullout. You just need to note their names. They may all be against it, but really <clears throat> listen to the, you know, particularly the media. I agree. You know, pay attention to who's really against it because those, this, those, that's the enemy right there. Well, it, and it's also part of Spot the Spook. <laughs> yes. Well, it seems like everybody's on board. Not that that wouldn't be possible too. Well, the one clip I do have that I think, uh, is interesting because it was it was offset from the Judy's report on Trump leaving Syria and firing Mattis. Mm-hmm. And it seems to if you just kind of dissect it, it seems to explain what really went on here is that, you know, they think it's like Trump decided. Let's just leave. When it, it's quite possible that he did a bunch of deals in the background because he was floating around, especially with Turkey. To to get himself out, get our guys out and put somebody else in to finish the job because there's two factors in this Turkey uh, situation. And this is explained on PBS NewsHour, but it's done as a separate story that's got nothing to do with anything. But play this leaving Syria Erdogan deal with Trump. Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan today welcomed U.S. plans to leave Syria. That came as the Associated Press reported that President Trump made the decision after speaking with Erdogan last week. In Istanbul, the Turkish leader said he promised the president that Turkey will finish off Islamic State militants. We will be working on our operational plans to eliminate Islamic State elements, which are said to remain intact in Syria in line with our conversation with President Trump. In other words, over the next months, we will adopt an operational style geared toward this goal. Erdogan also said that Turkey is delaying a planned operation against U.S.-backed Kurdish forces in Syria. Meanwhile, the Kurds warned their fighters may have to leave the fight against ISIS to confront any Turkish attack. Yeah. Now, there's there's obviously deals happening here. And I think for Trump it was... You know what? Uh, just stop all the crap about Saudi Arabia. You know, get a, take a back seat on the Khashoggi thing. I'll give you uh, Syria. I don't care anyway. I'll give you that. Yeah. It's, it seems that cut and dry. I think so too, and I think he he, he had to protect the Kurds. 
and all the protection consists it's, it's of part was, of this part of the deal because it was part of the deal. Erdogan so right said, no, "Yeah, he said, oh, no, uh, we won't uh, go after the Kurds right away. We're we're going to hang back." Yeah, for a so bit. he gave Kurds a heads up to yep, get out get of town. Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they'll go back to where they came from and and, and leave Syria. And the Turks are going to come in full force to take these the rest of these idiots, these ISIS idiots, out. There's one and other. That's that. The whole thing will, that'll be. Oh my God! There may be some peace. At least for us. Well, there's two other things that uh, about. Well, first of all, there was a, an interesting ad in uh, Recoil magazine, which is some uh, like aerospace defense magazine, and it was the, the remember the old Blackwater logo with like the claw Blackwater, the uh, the mercenaries, yeah, the Eric Prince. And yeah. so they took out a full page ad. I don't know what that costs in Recoil magazine, but. Completely black, the Blackwater logo, and then just the words, we are coming. And the thinking is that pullout of Syria, but certainly Afghanistan, is all kind of surface stuff. Like, let's bring our, let's bring our boys and girls home. But in the meantime, we do send in Blackwater, Z Academy, whatever they're called today, uh, to still you know, have the covert operations that we need when we need them. Like maybe for the poppy fields. Apparently, we still need him at the poppy fields. Something like that. And then here, and this is just Turkey in general. A new update came out for uh, iPhones and iPads. I don't use one anymore, but I do have this. It's iOS 12.1.2. And it includes bug fixes for your phone. Uh, Two in particular. Fixes bugs with eSIM activation and addresses an issue that could affect cellular connectivity in Turkey. I'm thinking, wait a minute. What, what system is Turkey using that could be an issue? And I, I went to look for it, and the first thing you hit right off the bat is from the... When was this? This was, I think, a couple of weeks ago. That uh, Turkey President Tayyip Erdogan announced today the country would boycott all electronics from the United States, in particular targeting specifically Apple amidst the rising trade tensions between the two countries. Um, So it, it may just be coincidence, but you have a country threatening to boycott a device specifically, and then they do an update with something that is uh, fixes something not working on the Turkish um, cell phone network. To me, it sounds like maybe they inserted something to make it work better on the Turkish cell phone network, like they might do with China. Or maybe they turned off something. They turned off the spy device. No, I think and- that, I, no, because Turkey said, we don't, we're going to boycott your phones. Well, if it's going to make the phone work more like a spy device, why wouldn't they just keep boycotting the phone? How about if it's working as a spy device for them, for the Turkish government? Oh, for the Turkish uh, Just like the Chinese device. have some special updates. Oh, so they can spy on their yes, people. Yes, exactly. Well, yeah, they got to do something about the Gulenists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, I can buy that. That could be part of it. I'd, I'd like to know more about it. I'd like to know more about it, though. I'm very interested in. Well, they're not going. You're not going to hear it. <laughs> you, you heard all you're going to hear, and it's on this show. <laughs> I can't accuse Apple of anything because you know that could get us deplatformed. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think something's up now. Uh, turning Turkey into a major trading partner with the United States is not a bad idea. Uh, I still uh, admire. From my visit there, the glassware that is made in Turkey is world class, and it never gets out of Turkey. Or the, I mean, it does, but not into the United States. And it's so cheap; it's, it would be it's just incredibly competitive. There's a lot of stuff that they, it might benefit both countries, and maybe Trump's doing a good thing here overall, giving Turkey half of Syria. And uh, well, it's it, you know he's not just giving it to Turkey; he's giving it to Russia, he's giving it to Iran, and I think as we yeah, and, as we, and, the, and Syria, yeah, and yes, Give thank and Syria, the, their own country, and fine, let everyone fight it out, you know, let everyone run around, you know, it was, it was the French who wanted us to do that. I mean, that's really where it all com- stems from, from total oil, you know, and I haven't heard anything about French 
uh, operatives being taken out. The French suckered us into Vietnam, too, if you recall. Yeah, not from firsthand experience, but yeah. Yeah, I've seen the Ken's, Ken Burns documentary, but it wasn't really spelled out that well about well, no, France's very role. sly about it. So it seems to me like... For uh, one, let's, let's face what, it seems you go on with that, but it, first of all, the Russians were always in Syria. Yes, they had that they, big they had the port. port. They, they used the port, it. yes. So what's new about Russia being there? Nothing. Nope. No. So now all of a sudden it's a big deal. Russia's pulling this Trump strings. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm just anti-war, so I'm happy with it. I don't see any reason. You know, I understand what our what our uh, what our business is here in the United States. I'm not ashamed of it. I, I'd leave if I was. But you know, we create war stuff. That's what we spend the most money on. That's what the most people and working in an industry. And of course, we have the other side of it, healthcare. But uh, we make war stuff. There is also an eleven billion dollar contract Erdogan agreed to for more of our stuff as a part yeah, of this good. deal with Trump. You know, and, and so the same goes for Saudi Arabia. You know, one hundred and ten, hundred and twenty billion dollars. He's just like, why don't you guys take all our stuff? We'll help you operate it and kill each other, and we'll just sit here with our own own oil. That could be an actual strategy. It's not a bad strategy. I just like to know why the Lib Joes out there are all pro-war all of a sudden. Because they're anti-Trump. It's just whatever he does, you got to be against him, no matter what your position was in the past. And now it's get, getting to an interesting point where people who should be pacifists and, and want peace on Earth are advocating for the exact opposite. And, and that's well, why, it's funny. That's why you got to keep an eye on who's doing, who's saying what, because you got to remember what they're doing. Yeah. Quite amusing. All right. Uh, I think that we've covered well, most well, of that. Well, this anger kind of crossed over with the wall and uh, yeah, some bit. some shoehorning, th- ramming through of uh, the, a $5 billion budget last minute through the House, which, of course, has, you know, has to go through the Senate, which seems impossible. But it was I, – I don't know what the move is, but the way it played out in the M5M – is Trump was kind of hanging back. He was defeated because, you know, Nancy and Chuck went into the Oval Office, beat the crap out of him. He was like, ooh. But then it was apparently um, people like Ann Coulter and, uh, and anyone on Fox who were telling the, uh, the president that he, you know, he lost his manhood and he should stand up, stand up for the wall. And hilariously, that's how it was interpreted by Jeffrey Tubin constitutional well, lawyer worst, that guy. on CNN. And, and Republicans are complaining, Jeffrey, uh, that uh, they, they can't figure out exactly where the president stands. They meet with him. Uh, they hear what he's saying, but he's not telling them, I'm going to sign this, but I'm not going to sign that. Well, what they should be doing, obviously, is checking with Ann Coulter, because apparently she's the president of the United States, as far as this is concerned. I mean, this was a deal. This deal was agreed to. Mitch McConnell, who was nobody's idea of a flaming liberal, Paul Ryan, everybody thought this deal was done. And you know what? The president lost on the wall because he didn't have the votes. But then, you know, Laura Ingram and, and Ann Coulter started challenging the president's manhood and, and the, uh, uh, the House Republicans started stamping their feet. And the president decided, no, 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 I'm going to scream and yell and shut down the government, even though I still don't have the votes. So, I mean, I guess Ann Coulter has to figure out how this is all going to end because she's the person who is driving um, the, the federal government at this point. God help us. God help us. <laughs> I'm not so sure. Is this what- guy, that lunatic. And by the way, why is he? I mean, this is just a promotion for Ann Coulter. Yeah. And she's been misquoted and they just use her. They use her as a whipping boy. They like to throw her out. Well, but there also, for the, some reason. The, the manhood thing that came from um, some overheard conversation of Nancy Pelosi. Yes, exactly. So I'm not quite sure how, how this got to uh, – I mean, I didn't follow any of that because I, I barely watched that kind of stuff. Uh, so here, here, is, here is Shields. There's Brooks and Shields, by the way. They, they took Brooks away, and they put in this Gershon guy. So now it's Shields and, and a worse Shields. Um, this, it, PBS has gone off the rails. I mean, they don't have any balance whatsoever anymore. 
But listen to Shields misquoting Coulter. Hours away from yet another government shutdown. What does it say about the way things are working right now in our government? Well, uh, it, not well, Judy. I mean, we went from a week ago, you recall, in the White House, which seems eons ago, uh, when uh, Senator Schumer and uh, Democratic House leader and Speaker B. Pelosi met with the president and the president, you know, manfully stepped up and said, I'll take the shut, shut, shut down, you know, be happy to do it on my, uh, put it to, to me, uh, then to an agreement uh, with the Senate uh, that it would stay, uh, they, they fund it through the new year and uh, then come back and revisit it, Uh, and then immediately a reaction, a revulsion, if you would, uh, from the president's uh, longest and strongest supporters, uh, TV commentators on the right, uh, uh, such as Rush Limbaugh and Coulter, uh, and said that this was a sellout on the wall, and Coulter going so far as to say his presidency was a joke, um, and uh, that uh, he had scammed the American people. Oh, so now they brought in a couple, so this is all... Um, Republican right wing talk people. So she, yeah. Now they're now they're important. Uh, I never have them on these but, shows. But, but hold on, hold hold on. There's something more behind this. I don't know what it is yet. But there's no reason for a guy like this to. I mean, okay, you can talk about Ann Coulter. So that was maybe somewhere the impetus. But you bring in Rush Limbaugh. I've heard other. Uh, you know, yeah. of course they bring in Hannity and Carlson. Any anybody they can from mainly from Fox News. What's the there's there's more to well, that. First of all, let's make the correction here that she never said the presidency's a joke. She had a longer uh, comment. She says if after four years he doesn't get the wall built, then the presidency will be a joke. Uh-huh. That's a lot different than the presidency's a joke and a scam. I don't know where you got even got that part. <laughs> but there is a. Um, I don't know. Maybe they're trying to separate the herd or they're trying to uh, do something, uh, divide and conquer the right wing. uh, I think they're going for a massive cable deplatform. Deplatform Fox News from every cable station in the country. No, that's not going to be even (laughs) close. That that is too hard to do. Hey, they they did deplatform your boy. And who's my boy? Your boy is, uh, hold on, I'll tell you. Your boy, well, it's not your boy. Your boy is Savage, Michael Savage, kicked off of New York, so he effectively lost his uh, his New York affiliate. Yeah, WGN. That, that's they, a, that's a huge issue. Off. That's a huge problem. Oh, it's a major problem. He's now <laughs> no, he's well, he, he's he's deplat effectively deplatformed from national radio. You 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 don't have New York. You have almost nothing. I come from that business. New York's a big deal. It's the um, deal. It's the yeah, deal. New York uh, threw him out. Uh, it is causing a problem, by the way. I think that it may cause more trouble for WGN than it does for anyone. Well, but you know who they're bringing in? And this is what I found interesting. Ben Shapiro. Oh, God. Ben Shapiro is unlistenable. Ben Shapiro is a shill. He is a Hollywood creation. By admission. He's a Hollywood creation, and now he's got uh, he's got seven stations. He's cleared in New York. He's cleared in D.C. He's cleared in Chicago, and these are good stations: um, ABC New York, WLS Chicago. He's got Atlanta. He's got KBC Los Angeles. This is a massive change. But Shapiro was also not a not a uh, a pro Trump guy. No, he was anti Trump. Yeah, I think I think, I think he is a never Trumper. But he's really being put. He's he's being positioned in. He can't handle it. Yes, he can. I don't think so. You, you yes, he no. can. It doesn't. The number of people that irrelevant. can handle that three hours of talk every day, five days a week, all it's, year. It, uh, it's irrelevant. Is a very small number of people. They're all semi nuts. Now, okay. Well, that not, not, I'm not interested in that part of it. I'm. He's being put in here. He has zero radio experience that I know of, and now he's again. He's, like I said, he can't handle it. That's what you what you just said is. But very it doesn't important. matter because he'll 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 stay in there to propagate the message. Look what's look he's he's replacing Michael Savage. He's nobody's going to listen to his show. It's imp- unimportant. It's very important. It's about, WG, it, there's money involved. That's very important. Okay, to these first guys. of all, you're wrong because they, uh, Ben Shapiro has quite an audience on online, and people like him. A lot of people like him. A lot of moderate people like him. I think he will, he has a following. I think it will translate 
to his radio show, but it will effectively uh, change the audience that listens to um, what they think would be right wing talk radio, which it won't be because it's it's just not what he's not. He's he's a never, he's he's more left wing than right wing, and it's which doesn't work very well on the radio. I'm agreeing with you, but they're going to give it a damn good shot with this kid. I think he's going to end up like Monica Crowley and some of these others that just do not draw the draw the audience. I I know what you're saying about he does have an audience. You're right, but a large, massive audience is very hard to control and very hard to attract. And he is annoying. <laughs> no. Hey, I had this argument at home about the guy. So you don't have to tell me this, but people like him. He has a, a message that is kind of down the middle and it's surplanting again, going back to the original uh, questions I, like what's happening? What, why are we picking on people? It's to, it's to get rid of them. It's time to deplatform all of these people. Well, it's a good try. You can go, go for it. I mean, you know, the joke is of course you what Savage did. He's doing <laughs> so a pod, He's doing a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He decided he's doing a podcast. He says, all you New Yorkers listen to my podcast. And I think a lot of them will. Because I think I think if anybody's going to drive the podcasting side of the industry, it could be him. Thank you, Michael. Mm. Now, Yeah, yeah, we need more competition. Good. I want to – I think we don't – we don't we, – we don't have any real competition. <laughs> now, I want to – mentioned something about five, six years ago, I think it was. And I, ever since then, I banished, I, I used your re, reaction. You don't even remember this. I'm absolutely sure of it. I played a Ben Shapiro clip on this show mm -hmm. around six years ago, and you went nuts. Really? Yes. You hated the guy. You didn't like his, you didn't like anything about him. He, I he's so never annoying. said that. No, no. Play me okay. the tape. It was like you were so irked by this clip that do, I have never played a Ben Shapiro do you, do you have the clip? Since. It's a lot too long ago. I probably do have it. I'll see if I can find it. And we'll play it again and see what your reaction is. I can't. But what was he I doing six to, years I ago? Your, reac your reaction is the general public's reaction to a guy like this. Yeah, maybe six years ago. Maybe he, look, he went through a complete change. He went through... You know, wardrobe, hair, makeup, the whole thing. You know, he's got. Oh, no, that's he's, good for radio. He's got a big. Yeah, he's got a big time agent. Yeah, it is. It really is. That's that's, that's what you get with an Ingraham. That's what you get with these. You know, Sean Hannity. It's a certain look. It's a certain type. But he's he's a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. I'm trying to see if I'm trying to see <laughs> Thank if you, I, brother Nathaniel. <laughs> let me see if I can find your uh, your Shapiro clip from six years ago. Yeah, Shapiro. It might, be under, it might be under Shapiro, might not. Mm. Okay, well, that's not helpful then. I mean, you'd look at look. Uh, do search engine. Let me see. 2014, maybe? That's five years ago. Uh, ben Shapiro on guns. Ben Shapiro, guns, mor morality, socialism, narcissism, egomaniacs. Ben Shapiro on Jews? No, that was 17. Uh, no, I don't have... No, nah, I don't... No, that's 14, right. 2014. We'll just, we'll just drop it. Well, you brought I, it up. I, I, think, just, I think Ben Shapiro radio is going to be a fail, uh, and it'll be fat, faster than we, we think. Okay, I think it will be successful, and uh, you will eat crow. Uh, I, I will refuse to eat crow. Crow is a, a very noble bird. <laughs> Ah, uh, how how did we get onto this? We were talking about the, uh, the these guys going off on Coulter. Yeah. And uh, meanwhile, we had I played the Shields clip where he, he makes all these assertions. So then I they got this guy Gershon from the Wapo 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 mm -hmm. comes on, and he's talking about this is the same. The topic is about the way Trump handled the budget issue to the point where we're at an impasse. Where does the fault lie? Well, big picture, this shows how easy the president of the United States is to manipulate. I mean, he had agreed to a deal. Then some of his you know, toughest supporters, Limbaugh and, and Coulter and uh, some of the team in the Fox News morning programs um, came out against it. And he changed his view like a puppet on a string. Mm -hmm. 
It was really extraordinary, a sign of weak leadership. Um, and I can bet you that Russia and China and North Korea look at something like that, about how easy this president is to manipulate. So that's the context for this. The, uh, you know, I, so I don't think that he can make a particularly good case, having agreed already to something rather reasonable, um, that, um, you know, that, there, that he changed his view with good reason. He can't make that case. What kind of balance is this <laughs> when well, it comes to the PBS? It, well, <clears throat> yeah, there's no balance. There are people that could rationalize and, and maybe give us some perspective from a different you know, point of view. But no, PBS, they, they've already done this with, with the global warming, and they've, they've admitted it. They cannot have, and, and Gore even chided them for even thinking about it. You cannot have anybody on, on on arguing against. You can't have anyone against the the global warming thesis on the show. They've already said that. So you have two people on. There's no balance. They're both going right. to say the same thing. <clears throat> right now, they've done it with the Shields and Brooks segment, where you got Shields who hates Trump with a guy who hates Trump more. Is that what your balance is? Real hate and kind of subtle hate. Maybe then doesn't hate him so much, but this guy hates him a lot. And that's what we're, that, there's your balance. There's balance there, isn't there? If I were you, I'd return my donation and my tote bag. Luckily, I don't <laughs> donate to them. Let's listen to another globalist, Maisie Hirono, who they like to call, because you know, no one ever heard of Maisie Hirono of Hawaii. That's because she's pretty much an idiot. Yes, but she says fun things. I was very distressed by it, of course. And um, it, he made it very clear that uh, he and, uh, and President Trump were not on the same page in terms of their worldviews. And, of course, uh, Trump's worldview is uh, uh, is very, uh, how shall I say, out of whack because he comes up with it himself. And uh, these last two days, I feel as though we have been on a roller coaster with him at the uh, controls because first there's the announcement that we're getting out of Syria where we know that he didn't discuss it with anybody including General Mattis uh, now giving a huge Christmas present to Putin and to <laughs> Iran Christmas then present. because I've been very focused on what's going on at the border they make an announcement that people who come uh, who are coming through for asylum purposes have to wait on the Mexican side where there are huge safety concerns for so many of the children mm -hmm. and then of course the Senate did the responsible thing last night by keeping government running, passing this bill by a voice vote, and only to have President Trump get all worked up because he's got some right-wing loud people yelling at him on Fox News, and suddenly he says, well, I don't think I'm going to sign it. So it is very true that he will <coughs> bring on this shutdown, and he has to take responsibility for it. Any effort on his part to blame the Democrats it will be such bullshit that, as I said before, I would hardly be able to stand it. I think she said bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> and good not, for her. I, I admire that. I, I give her points for the bullshit. <laughs> yeah, really. But there's the there's the the clear talking point. You know, it's like the crazy you know, people on there. Fox News. It's and you know they're they're, they're go not on the same page. I've heard yeah, that a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I think really this has more to do with a serious. Media offensive on a competitor in the space. Um, you know, I the, like your theory. Yeah, the Michael I'm Savage not a, stuff is a subscriber, but I like it. The Michael Savage uh, removal from ABC in New York is an advertiser related issue. You know, they went after his advertisers. Yeah, well, they do that. Well, yeah, well, it was successful. That's my point. Well, that, we can do every show. We can bring one example of that up. That's the problem with the media today. Right. But it. But when it's working and let's see how it goes. You know, we'll see. There's, there's too much of this at the same time. It's too, too much of the same stuff. I think there's more. There's a little more behind it. It could be wrong. Um, we need to talk about deplatforming in general because we have a couple of things to discuss. We'll do that in a moment. But first, I do need to. I thank you for your courage and say in the morning to the man who put the C in the DRC, John C. Dvorak. Well, in the morning to you, Mr. Adam Curry. Also in the morning to all ships at sea and boots on the ground and feet in the air and subs in the water. And also 
the dames and the knights out there. And a hearty ho-ho in the morning to the trolls in our troll room at noagendastream.com. And uh, they are active today, but always handing out little one-liners, information and feedback. It's a great way to, if you're producing a show, I recommend you try to record it while doing it live and have a troll room. But get your own trolls. Uh, Noagendastream.com. Also, a thanks to our artist for the 1096 episode of this podcast series. Mike Riley brought us that artwork, which a lot of people liked. A lot of people, it, it like fried their brain. And when you first see it, when you see this map of the world and you see Africa and the, and Europe reversed on the map, it kind of hurts your brain for a second. But everyone got it, even before they had heard the show. Like, oh, okay, I know I know what this is supposed to mean. It was good. I, I thought it was a great piece. Yeah, it really had the uh, – well, my Riley, who has been left out of the, um, out of the winter circle for a while, uh, it appeared to have been kind of decided, or he's appeared to have decided to win. So he provided <laughs> he put, a lot of he art. He put a lot of art up. Yeah, he did. <laughs> so we, uh, <laughs> I'm not letting this one slide by, and he did have the best piece, and that was it. Hmm. Well, we do have a few people to thank for being executive producers and associate executive producers for show 1097. Yes, and, and I do want to reiterate, we are doing a live show. We'll also be doing a live show uh uh, before New Year's, unlike everybody else in media who's taking it off, taking it easy, sipping the eggnog, we're here at the at the at the wheel grinding away for you. Yeah, no eggnog for us, at least not at the moment. Sir D- uh, David, the Baron of Pennsylvania, came in at the top of the list at four hundred forty-four dollars and forty-four cents from Norristown, Pennsylvania. Uh, he wishes all the producers and hosts hosts a berry with a B, Merry Christmas. And a hoppy new year. <laughs> mm-hmm. No jingles, no nothing. No, he says NJNGS. What is that? No jingles, no. Goat something. scream. <laughs> no. <laughs> I gave it to you anyway. I got it. No jingles, no goat scream. Took me a second. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was, okay. No. Sir Cal, 420 bucks. There he is. Donate. Yeah, Sir Cal. This donation is lieu of the farm bill getting signed, making hemp and CBT, uh, CBD legal nationwide. That's right. Uh, low girl, yay. Please pronounce or announce our coupon co- code ITM again. We've been getting a lot of support and love from the No Agenda folk, mostly thanks to you two. Happy holidays, good health, and lots of bourbon to you and your family. Sir Cal of the LavenderBlossoms.org. That's LavenderBlossoms.org. That's free publicity. He's a... Uh, CBD uh, specialist. Well, I mean, I get all my CBD products from LavenderBlossoms.org. And Cal just showed up on our radar and said, oh, yeah, I've been doing this. Uh, I'll send you some. Uh, But he gives a discount to uh, to Noah Jenna listeners with the ITM code. And I like his little uh, 420 donation. That's nice. Thank you, sir, Cal. Uh, Uh Your your products. I get the joke. That's funny. I got it now. I, I don't know why I got it. All right. Uh, onward, Sir Donald Borowski, Vice Viscount. Uh, he is the uh, Sir Donald of the Fire Bottles, Viscount of Eastern Washington. Ah, yes, 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 yes. And he sent us three hundred fifty nine dollars and thirty seven cents, which is usually, which is a lot for him because normally he sends in smaller amounts, but still gets his notes read because they're on United Federation of Planets letterhead, Starfleet Command, to be specific. Gentlemen, I missed the donation opportunity for show 1089, 33 squared. Let me overcompensate with a donation in pennies of 33 cubed. <laughs> <laughs> Which is $359.37. This Perfect. donation marks four years of listening. Wow. My sanity has never been better. End of show request. The song, It's Time to Do It Now in the Morning. A oh. sweet version, which opens No Agenda Show 300. Well, if you don't mind, I, I will gladly do that on the next show. We have, an, this is a Christmas show, so we can't play any more end of show mixes about Christmas. Uh, so I have a number of them lined up. So I will do I it. Think, on the, I think that's appropriate. Yeah. And I speak for the peerage committee when I say that. Okay. 
And that, and he says, uh, other than that, he doesn't have anything but that request. It's, I'm looking at both sides of the sheet. Nope. I give him a car, a general karma. He can use it. You've got karma. Uh, so Walkman of Buckeye, three hundred thirty-three dollars and thirty-three cents. He's in Louisville, Ohio. ITM gents, my cybersecurity sales commissions are yours for the hard work of media deconstruction. A Christmas no agenda tip here: indulge on the eggnog, <laughs> smoke them if you got them. And keep watering those trees, but most importantly, keep Crackpot and Buzzkill going by contributing. <laughs> Shout out to my smoking hot MILF wife, Laura. Merry Christmas, Adam and John. Merry Christmas, Sir Walkman of Buckeye. Thank you. Now we have a note here, and this one is... I got, uh, a, I got a package from uh, Baron D.H. Slammer. Did you get a package? I did. Did you open your package? Yeah, of course I did. I got a Space Force Challenge coin. I got a Space Force Challenge coin, too. Did, did you get anything get some, else? I got some glycerin soap. Yeah, with Professor Ted? Yeah. Yeah, I got that one, too. <laughs> it's apparently in it. And did you get a bottle of mulled wine? Yes. A bottle of wine with the mulling stuff. Yeah. It. Yeah, it was so nice. And it was... Yeah, it, it was, was a nice package. Well, let's say... This is not really from... Uh, Baron D.H. Slammer. It is from Baron D.H. Slammer, Baroness Bang Bang, Dame Simona, Sir Andrew, and Master Emmett. Yes, Master Emmett is signed with a goat head on there. <laughs> uh, Do you, I get the idea that um, Bang Bang and Slammer, you know, force their kids to work jobs to donate to the show. Do you get that feeling? I never got it before, but now that you mention it. <laughs> and I like it. I think it's good. Like, he do your chores. In, you got to support the show. He writes and closes a bottle of mulled, mulled wine featuring an inappropriate label that John, John should enjoy. I guess Adam wouldn't. Yeah, I enjoyed which it. Which pairs nicely with the uh, holiday, holiday hors d'oeuvre, whores devours, and great company. You will find a Space Force Challenge coin and custom handmade Professor Ted glycerin soap. Happy winter solstice from Baron D.H. Slammer, Bang Bang, Simona, uh, Andrew, and Master Emmett. So, who I believe is the youngest one if you look at his signature. Yes. So I want to thank them for this uh, fine donation. Space Force. They're in Los Angeles. You've got <laughs> karma. A little karma of the goat for them. Thank you so much. It was nice to get that. Really appreciate it. Joel Neddu. Neddu. Nitto in Liberty, Missouri, two hundred eighty dollars and eight. Two X Boober for the great greatest podcast. What the great GPC greatest podcast? I guess uh, greatest, but we had the, the okay best podcast actually. Shout out to Earl Robert F uh, to Earl Robert Alter and the producers of NA who are shining examples of non douche baggery. I'm calling out my brother, Chris. Lemon, lemonator, 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 something like that, uh, who hit me in the mouth in 09, but has been a douchebag for a long time. Douchebag. You guys are the standard by which other podcasts are measured. Semper Fi, mother effers. <laughs> Please de douche me. <laughs> <laughs> You've been de douched. Yeah, give you a little Semper Fi karma on the, on the side. You've got there you karma. Go. Thank you, Joel. Uh, Nikki uh, Lowelli, I think. Lowelli? L-O-E-L-E. -E. $250 should be an associate executive producer. I apologize for the email. I was afraid that my message would get cut off online. I just, I said, blah, blah, blah. I'm donating the show 1097 on behalf of my wonderful boyfriend, Andrew, for Christmas. Aww. Both of us are huge fans from central New Jersey. We both thank you for the five hours of sanity per week that we cherish. Hopefully, Andrew will hear this because I caught him skipping the donation segment in the past. What? I'd like to request an oobla dee oobla da <laughs> jingle and any clip involving a vocal fry, if possible. Also, <laughs> since Andrew has never donated himself, he's a douchebag. Oh, my. Douchebag. <laughs> since I'm donating on his behalf, that make, might make me the douchebag. No, it doesn't. I'm aware of, I'm not aware of how it works, but someone should be called out as a douchebag. We did. Merry Christmas to you both, Nikki. Okay. 
All right. Uh, Obviously, I re- I read the New York Times like all day long, uh, mainly oh, on my iPad app. Obama, Ebola, that's a song. Oh, Ebola's gonna kill us all. You've got karma. <laughs> and onward. And- <laughs> I love it when people do stuff like that, you know. Gifts, birthdays, Christmas. It's very sweet. Thanks, Nikki. Alex Brewer in Nags Head, North Carolina, 23457. Uh, this is Alex of Ignite Films, a Southern Hollywood outfit. Oh, I remember that. Sure. Hey, Alex. Yeah. yeah. Ignite Films is one of those filmmaking operations. I could go down there and do a bit part. I can, do, I can take one day and, and do a short bit. Fame is in your cards. <laughs> Hey, is that who's knocking on the door? <laughs> huh? How was that? I'm Very, eternally, it's eternally fantastic. I'm, I, my father, you know, Arthur, you, hit me in the kisser in the summer of 16, a summer full of ups and downs as I wed my smoking hot wife, Sarah, saw a dramatic uptick in the success of my small business, and most of all, found you two and became aware of your infinite wisdom. Mm. Now I have been unleashed upon the world with a new perspective as the proverbial wool has been lifted from my three eyes. Thanks to your de- deconstruction of the media, I've embraced a new way of looking at situations, whether they be yarn spun by our beloved M5M or daily interactions in my personal life. And all done with laughs and giggles to boot. Aww. I look forward to achieving knighthood in the near future. Aww, thank you, Alex, and Merry Christmas to you. Throw a little karma your way. You've got karma. Can't hurt. Probably. Uh, I got a note from his dad, too, He's which is next. He uh, probably, and they did, one did 5-7, one did 5-6. I get it now. Um, he probably has less, they're both in Tennessee, or he's in North Carolina, dad's in Tennessee. But that part of the world. The likelihood of, of listening to the show, developing kind of a different perspective on things, and then losing all your friends yeah. is less there. Yes. Yes. It is true. There. True. I like this idea of people donating and because clearly they understand how it works, you know, changing it by one penny to be right after that person on the donation list. Yeah. That's an interesting or idea. That's, yeah. Or, or before or after. Yeah. It's an interesting way to coordinate. I like it. So this is Arthur Alex's Brewer. dad, yeah. Yeah, Arthur Brewer in Madisonville, Tennessee. Uh, Alex was in Nags Head, North Carolina. Two, three, four, five, six, one penny less. As you're now now aware, as you're now aware, I hit my son Alex of Ignite Films, a Southern Hollywood outfit. They both put this, a Southern That's Hollywood great. outfit. That's great. Square in the mouth about 18 months ago. We are both loyal supporters of the best podcast in the universe, hands down, and never miss a show. Your deconstruction of the M5M is spot on every time, and we thought, and we thoroughly enjoy your fantastic analysis, playful banter, and the all-around great vibes uh, in every tasty morsel of the show. I very much look forward to my knighting ceremony soon. Take care. Arthur, your once and future king. All right. Thank you, Arthur. Also, And thanks for hitting your kid in the mouth. That's uh, important stuff. A little karma. You've got no. Karma. It's pretty generally uh, assumed that in the South, the dads hit their kids in the mouth all the time. Yeah, well, it's what, what they do. David Nixon in Montreal, Quebec, 222. ITM John, I believe this gets me to knighthood, especially with the Scandinavian K- dollars. I would like a goat karma and to be henceforth known as Sir Dave of Lower Canada. Merry Christmas. Fantastic, Dave. See you on the podium later on in the show. Looking forward to it. You've got... <laughs> Karma. You know the uh, I think I think it was the guys on the I don't know noagendasocial dot com, but they came up with a new uh, a new karma jingle that I wanted to share. You've got shawarma. <laughs> I hadn't heard that one before. I like getting a little shawarma. A little shawarma. Yeah. Uh, David, no, okay, it was David Nixon, uh, Michael Reardon, $201. Uh, Merry Christmas, guys. My wife and I love your show. All the best wishes for another stellar year in 2019. A nice dose of all-around karma to kick off the new year, please. Mike and Monica, ITM. Thank you, guys. You've got karma. 
Dame Firecracker in Frisco, Texas, 200 bucks. Uh, Merry Christmas to my wonderful husband getting you on the way to knighthood. Lots of, oh, this is, goes, this is gonna be dedicated. Uh, lots of love, Cli- climate gate jingle, please. It, that's so sweet that you do that. Oh, beautiful. To the gate, to the gate, to the climate gate. I'll chase it up with a little bit of karma since I'm feeling good about it being Christmas. You've got karma. And last on our list of associate executive producers is is Derek Boggs, two hundred dollars parts unknown. Keep up the great the great work. I'm donating because you guys are the best. And the deconstruction that you do on climate change this is a coincidence for you. Mm-hmm. On climate change is unrivaled goat. <laughs> <laughs> Goat it is. <laughs> You've got <laughs> karma. <laughs> and since he capitalized it, I think he refers to greatest of all time. Ooh, yes. So it's a double entendre which, without the filth. Uh, I want to thank all these folks for being executive producers and associate executive producers of show 1097. That wouldn't show wouldn't be even here if it wasn't for you. And all the rest of the uh, producers. Uh, and we want to mention, you know, we got 97, 98, 99. We have show 11, Lucky 1100 coming up. Uh, uh, first show of the of 2019. Fantastic. And that will be, what is it, the third? Two, three. Is it the third? No. Uh, it's. Uh, yeah. So the yeah, fourth. I don't know. The, no, fourth? the first is on Tuesday. Okay. Second, third. You're right. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. So third. the third. And that'll be show 1100, man. That will be a good newsletter. Um, <laughs> I want to thank everybody. Uh, Here, these... I'll give it to a preview. It's show 1100. <laughs> okay, great. We're here. We did it. Whoo! can't believe we made it. 1100. Thank you to our executive producers and our associate executive producers for this Christmas show. Uh, it is nice that you have uh, supported the work. It, you never know with stuff like this if we can, you know, if we can get any support because most people face it, you know, just getting ready to celebrate Christmas. So, and I see on the stream people are showing up, so we love it. And these credits can be used anywhere credits are recognized. So please um, take them out and post them and get whatever you need out of it. And uh, thank you for supporting the No Agenda Show. We do have another show coming up on uh, uh, Sunday, and uh, again, that'll be our pre New Year's uh, New Year's show. <laughs> Sorry, hey, hey. didn't mean to do that. What? Another show's coming up on Thursday. What's today? Sunday. Oh, damn. It's always Thursday. Dvorak.org slash N-A. Donate to No Agenda. Donate to No Agenda. Donate to No Agenda for a happy new year. We'll reach a note and play your jingles. Reach a note and play your jingles. Reach a note and play your jingles for 200 or more. Our formula is this we go out, we hit people in the mouth. Yes, Chris Wilson uh, from Australia, the drunken, drunkard minstrel, has uh, outdone himself along with, uh, uh, let's see, Charles Couch, uh, Secret Agent Paul, uh, Tom Starkweather put together some great end of show mixes for us. Uh, goat and Christmas oriented. Cool. Because <laughs> we're very goat oriented here wrap on the show. the show with a great Christmas medley. Yes. Yeah. It'll, it'll be a good one. Um, deplatforming. Yes. I want to talk about deplatforming for a moment. And this, uh, I think it came, we were talking, maybe I should play this, uh, this clip first, actually. Uh, this is about 5G. And I don't know. Yeah, I, I do want to play this actually, because you were deplatformed from PC magazine for writing, for basically just questioning 5G technology. Well, I wasn't even that. What I did is I wrote a column about how many people were questioning it. I wasn't questioning it. And I I outlined all these different things. And then I made the assertion that 
this could become a problem for people promoting 5G. And interestingly, AT&T announced just this week that they would be um, updating their phones. So if you have AT&T on your Android phone or your iPhone, um, you will, within the new year, receive a little notification where it says 4G LTE. It'll say uh, 5G E, which stands for evolution, which means it's not 5G. It's bull crap. It's marketing. But these yeah, guys, bull crap. But, they, but they're stupid. This is the possibly the stupidest thing you can do to gain market share in unproven technology that is not rolled out. I mean, unproven in uh, certainly from a health perspective, but unproven in many uh, areas. They want to be the first because you know T-Mobile is trying to get out We're there and the be first. first. Yeah, foam finger. We're AT and T. But when you hear about some of the testimony going on about five G. Uh, such as Dr. Sharon Goldberg that I have here. She's an internal medicine physician and professor, and yeah. she's testifying here about the possible dangers of uh, elo electromagnetic radiation associated with the 5G telephony networks. Wireless radiation has biological effects, period. This is no longer a subject for debate when you look at PubMed and the peer-reviewed literature. These effects are seen in all life forms, plants, animals, insects, microbes. In humans, we have clear evidence of cancer now. There is no question. Um, we have evidence of DNA damage, cardiomyopathy, which is the precursor of congestive heart failure, neuropsychiatric effects. So 5G is not a conversation about whether or not these biological effects exist. They clearly do. We've been sitting on the evidence for EMR, and chronic disease for decades. Um, and now we are seeing all these epidemics appearing. So diabetes is the first epidemic. I think most of you know the statistics. One in three American children will become diabetic in their lifetime, and if they're Hispanic females, the number is one in two. So what does this have to do with wireless radiation? Wireless radiation and other electromagnetic fields, such as magnetic fields and dirty electricity, have been clearly associated with elevated blood sugar and diabetes. That is what the peer-reviewed literature says. It is not opinion. The closer you live to a cell tower, the higher your blood glucose. So the idea with small cells of putting the cells closer to people's homes and bedrooms scientifically is very dangerous. And from an economic perspective, it's dangerous. And you may not know this. I was shocked to find this out. But the way you create a, a model of diabetes in rats in the lab is by exposing them to 2.4 gigahertz. And this is not for long-term exposure. The other epidemics that clearly link from the science with electromagnetic radiation are related to mental health. And this is, this is straight from PubMed. This isn't my opinion. This is science. So we have three epidemics that clearly, they're essentially one epidemic. We have deterioration of mental health in the United States. So, and these epidemics are our suicide epidemic, epidemics in violent, so shootings, and the opioid epidemic. These are facts. These aren't, and these are things that have just been glossed over by the wireless industry, and I, I really don't have time to talk about them in five minutes. I wish I did. Um, but we need to examine our epidemics in the context of our EMF exposures. Now, I want to believe all this, but I have to say, listening to her with its PubMed, peer-reviewed, its science, the science is in, no questions asked, shut up, slave, I'm a little skeptical about it now. Yeah. What do okay. you think? What do you think? I, I think well, I don't have any uh, uh, firsthand knowledge of any of this. I do know I have a number of uh, friends that were on the cell phone for too long, and they're all dead. Because of the uh, cell phone? I, all I know is it seems unlikely that they would have been dead otherwise. Uh, uh, I don't know. So, well, I mean, you can take any perspective you want on this. The lot, there's a, but there's like a number of – there's a couple of professors, one at Cal that has a web page filled with documents about this mm -hmm. apparently it's being studied to death and most of these things get suppressed and that concerns me that concerns me more than what she says and she's not saying the science is in because everybody else says she's full of crap well oh, the, the, the science is in on the other side the thing that uh that bugged me about her testimony she's talking about 2.4 gigahertz that's not 5g isn't that supposed to be much higher isn't that isn't that in the 50 gigahertz range 
There's another woman who got deplatformed for writing about Wi-Fi, uh -huh. calling it Wi-Fried. <laughs> yeah. And we do know it's a microwave oven uh, uh, frequency that has got all kinds of protections around the microwave oven. And we're going to slowly microwave, being microwave ovened. And, and most of us have already determined that it's not, it's not at those levels, it's no big deal. Um, but it turns out that that is a big deal according to some studies. And they believe that the microwave uh, frequency, which is our, you know, Wi-Fi, everyone has it. You got one probably. Yeah, I was going to say. Thing yeah. right there, now your feet there. No, I have I have 2.4 gigahertz on my head, both sides. My uh, my hearing aids use uh, 2.4 gigahertz. For, yes, for for uh, the Apple AirPlay. I know. Or if I were you, I'd be concerned. I'm very uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's some evidence that it's that the diabetes epi epidemic is because of just the constant exposure. It's constant exposure to this. Now that that part I think is sounds realistic. But also, maybe we should just stop eating junk in America. That might might help us separate We're always the issues. Junk, so there's yeah. there's still a, still growing. Uh, it's 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 interest. Yes. Well, the combination is deadly. Mm. Now uh, the the five G is totally different story. It's a bunch just this micro millimeter wave technology is completely different, right? Than uh, this penetrating stuff and uh, millimeter wave doesn't penetrate very well. No, it, which is which is why you need all the that's why you need a million of these things with cells you with, uh, with millimeter waves. It's just a very sketchy. This technology is uh, it's like all technologies when they first come out they they rush the market so somebody can make a lot of money yeah. and we'll deal with it later. And even and I said on some show that I was on, I can't remember the name of it. Unfortunately, I should be able to, uh, but I probably lost my memory from why fried. The it, it, I call this the potential. This whole wireless revolution may be the asbestos uh of this 21st century hmm. and all the companies that are that are potential uh for being sued out of business mm -hmm. includes intel right but if this is a problem, they would want to hush it up for as long as they could until they can fix the problem, if they can fix it at all. But they're rushing the market with this 5G because those guys, the, the big telecom companies are all in. They they have they don't care about the technology as long as, you know, they got. They just want the marketing angle. They want the investor yeah. angle. That's what it seems like to me as well. Yeah, trying to run their stock up, trying to. Right. But this could be a two-way sword be, or two -way, double, double -edged, edged sword because the two-way sword. I like that. They. Uh, they can get the investors can turn on them if something, you know, some real something definitive comes out of like Washington, the White House, let's say about 5G. Mm -hmm. uh, Trump turns on it, for example. I mean, this is real risk. So I think it, so it comes down to market, market, really. Yeah. Yeah. OK, well, then it makes sense that you got to deplatform platform for that. You yeah, not on board. helping them. You know, the biggest advertisers in the United States are Verizon, uh, T-Mobile. I think AT and T is second or third. Those guys they advertise the most, so that would make sense that a, a magazine like PC Mag <clears throat> is is has sold out. Well, I think they've all sold out. Yeah. the uh, The number one way I see these days for you to get deplatformed is to call yourself a creator. <laughs> so I, I would advise you don't do that. Have you noticed this? I think I may have mentioned it before. I'm this. It really irks me. I can't explain exactly why, but and it's and it revolves around the Patreon uh, discussion, which for some reason people are still incredibly surprised that Patreon does not stand for complete free speech, uh, but really for what their community will uh, will accept. And oh my goodness, this is you got kicked off because uh, you know you didn't fit within the community, and people are surprised. Like Patreon owes them something, but every single one of these people talks about creators, and I think it's insulting, and I think it's bad that to lump every to lump podcasters and YouTubers and uh, and Scott Adams calls himself a creator. It's like it's just why is this bothering me? Can you please look in my head, Doctor Dvorak? I don't know why it's something I think it's actually the sound of the word or the word itself or the generality about what it is or maybe it trivializes or marginalizes. That, creative that's what types. it is. Yeah, I think maybe that's it. I'm a podcaster. I'm proud to say I'm a podcaster. That's not a creator. Well, you create a podcast. 
it was creator. Maybe it's because it sounds more like I'm God. I'm a creator. I'm God. Uh, that, That's it, probably. Maybe, yeah, you might see it as blasphemous and most of these people probably uh, do think they're all that and a bag of chips so then maybe that's why they call themselves so- we Could are the creators i tell you i the create media go to the adobe thing they call them creatives creatives i also didn't like that when when i had the, the agency I, I did i despise that too i think creatives despise it being called creatives yeah i think it puts you in a box yeah I don't want to go back to artist. It's a good word. Eh, but artist is mm. well established. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, you're an artist. The uh, I just wanted to mention for for people who are being deplatformed that there is a very thriving ecosystem. If you're interested, and it's all based around Activity Pub, uh, and doesn't you don't really need to know what that is, but it's uh, that it's kind of a a simple technology that allows the one thing RSS could never do, which is the publish subscribe model. Um, through anything but one huge, you know, centralized place. And this is what is loosely called the Fediverse. So if you want a Twitter-like thing, there's a Mastodon. If you want Instagram, there's PixelFed. If you want YouTube, there's PeerTube and BitChute, which work quite well, actually. But none of these, not a single one, will get you the same type of activity you have on the the big social networks, such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, etc., and that's mainly because there is no M5M feedback loop, so they're not talking about it and feeding back into it, and there's no algorithms. So it's not like the drugs that you get when you go into Twitter. It's fantastic if you want to just have a social network and interact, but it will never, ever be anything like, again, it's just pure drugs that you get from, um, from the al- 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 algalized uh, social networks. Ooh, algalized. algalized. Well, I, I do have one story in this regard. Oh, good. Uh, one of the guys that got deep platform which became a big deal, uh, and everyone who even mentions his name gets deep platformed including uh, PewDiePie. He bitched about this. I think he's still on YouTube, but he's not deep platformed. I, I think he got kicked off of Patreon. Oh, okay, but he's not deep platformed from YouTube. That'd be crazy. That'd be crazy to do that. No, they're not doing that. But he's but he lost his you know income streams. And so this Sargon of Akkad. Yeah, this is the, this is the thing that that started off uh, the Patreon deplatforming, and apparently huge fans uh, are Dave Rubin and um, a bunch of Peter guys. Peterson are big fans, and this, and because of this deplatforming of this guy, the uh, British guy, I think. Yes, his name is Carl Benjamin, and he uh, has this you know right wing. He's a real Brexit guy. And he uh, apparently said something not on his pet podcast, someplace else, somewhere along the lines. They accused him of saying something years ago about something, used the N word. I, 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 I need to make a distinction about something here because I I followed this and I I'm, it, it's interesting you bring it uh, to the show because I found it kind of uninteresting. Um, mainly because I, I like fo- the way you always do that. Well, I mean that. I mean, this, yeah. but it's good you're bringing it up now because the story has been around for two two three weeks. Um. First of all, the show, the, him, the guy himself, I just don't find interesting. I, it's like, okay, fine, whatever. Um, He's a British guy. What do you expect? What, you, were, you don't like the British. No, that's not true. What, what he did, um, you know, calling someone a white nigger, and that was supposed to be to show that, you know, basically the, the, the Joy Reid defense of, you know, I said faggot because he says faggot, and then you know how it feels, yeah. faggot. And, you know, so yeah, I, but this wasn't even anything yeah, that but, he what, but hold on. That's not the point. Okay, what's the point? Well, don't interrupt me. I'll get to it eventually. Okay. Like the Zephyr. Go. Patreon is not a platform. Everyone keep, it, it may be a payment platform. Yeah, it is. No, well, no, no. Payment you, platform. Yes. You but, use the word. But when I just want to make sure we make a distinction. YouTube is a hosting platform. Twitter is a hosting platform. Facebook is a hosting platform. The only thing Patreon is is a financial exchange. But now, for some reason, they talk about their creators like they own them. There's nothing hosted on their system. And you know, they, they're they just a bunch of dipshits who take 15% with a very simple web application to charge your credit card. It's MasterCard that's the problem. And I think that's who do, who's doing their, their processing. 
That is the payment platform. Patreon, just a bunch of leeches, really. Just opportunistic leeches. And I don't, I'm, I fail to see why people fall for this every single time. What are the, they falling for? For, for, for? for going along with what is called a platform, and all of a sudden you're their, you're their property. They were talking about people this way from the get-go. Our creators, our platform. You're supposed to, do you consider PayPal to be a platform that we're on? No. Not really. Does PayPal call us one of their creators? No. They don't even mention us, as a matter of fact. No, they should. They should do some ads for us. So, you know, so I'm a little sick of this. This is like uh, people got to open their no, eyes okay, and step let's back. back up a little bit. You seem to be outraged to an extreme. First of all, except for the two of us, 90% of the podcasters out there, we don't go to these conventions and all these things. I mean, you've been to a couple. I've never been to one of them. But we have people that go there. Uh, Jen Bryan is a huge fan of these things. And at these conventions, uh, podcasting conventions and whatever they are, conferences, they push this stuff. Well, here's how you make money as a podcaster. You get on Patreon. And they, it's promoted as a, as, a, as a way to make money as a podcaster. And all kinds of people have bought into it. And they only use Patreon. Many of them are completely – on Patreon only. They don't even think about the other stuff that we do or that, that other people try to do, which is, what do we need Patreon? People have told us, oh, you guys should be on Patreon. I've always been irked by this because why should we be on, what are they doing that we can't do ourselves? Well, there's a, they got this website and then they, that is what they're talking about when they talk about the platform. The platform is their their website that you have a, you're mentioned on. So it's kind of a platform. It's, you know, I would... I, I don't have the objection you have. I guess I guess it's apples to oranges where it, the defense of this this uh, Brexit Brit Sargon of Akkad is what I was doing wasn't on their platform. The uh, the only analogy that would be right is if you were on someone else's money platform. He doesn't create if content on Patreon. This is minor to me. Uh I think there's a, the other issue is the more interesting one and the one you should be happy about. But let, before I bring that up, let's at least listen to a guy giving us a rundown of Sargon of Akkad and, and the story so we, have, we know what we're talking – so people know what the hell we're arguing about. Sargon of Akkad, if you don't know, uh, is – he's got a YouTube channel just under a million subscribers. Uh, he is a, um, a political commentator, and this has nothing to do with, with – whether you agree with him or not, that's not the point. The point is, is that uh, he was making his living um, supporting his family, supporting his children, um, putting up really good content, some of the best content on the web. Um, and he was being supported uh, using Patreon um, to, to do this. Is this Dave Rubin? No, this is some guy. I can't remember his name, but he's just a, a okay. kind of a mid-level right. uh, video podcaster. He's very good. It's to make this happen. So out of the blue, uh, Patreon um, pulled his account, um, terminated his account without any explanation whatsoever. So I dug into this and to find, tried to find out what's going on because there's a big brouhaha over this. And what I found out was 10 months ago, um, Sargon of Akkad or Carl um, said something um, on a website, uh, podcast or something like that, that um, they deemed to be offensive. And therefore, even though it was not on the Patreon site, yanked his account. Right before Christmas, no explanation. He didn't violate the terms of service. They just deemed that, I think, they just didn't like him. We don't like him. We don't like you. We don't like your politics. Therefore, we're going to make you disappear. Okay. I, I realize... No. I, go ahead. I... I... I've done some uh, self-reflection. I'll wait. Please, I'll wait for you. Now, I do have a long story that Carl himself tells where he went to a conference and one of the women at the top uh, on the dais called him out as a douchebag in human garbage because he was sitting in the audience because she's a feminist and I guess he writes negative things about feminist game reviewers. And so she got bent out of shape. He protested to the uh, conference runners. They I ended up apologizing to her, not paying any attention to his uh, complaint because you're not supposed to do that. In other words, you're not supposed to be at, on the dais calling out members of the audience. And then it got the attention. She made a wrote a bunch of articles, got the attention of, PayPal, of, of Patreon, 
uh, demanding he be pulled, and she gets she throws a lot of weight around. Next thing you know, this guy's lost all his income. Now, the uh, the thing that that stems from this, we can play a little bit of this. It's too long to play the whole thing, but play a little bit so you can listen to this guy, so you know what his voice is, and you know what he's like, and why you probably don't like him because he's a little bit of a twit. In June 2017, I, along with many other YouTube creators, traveled to Los Angeles. Creators, okay, I'm done. That was the end of that clip for me. Creators, I'm a YouTube creator. Today's to attend that year's VidCon event. VidCon builds itself as a community festival, creator conference, and industry summit, all wrapped up into one. We'd gone there to have a good time and meet one another. At VidCon, there were public panels, most of which had not been announced when we purchased our tickets, <laughs> and we attended one with a polite woman called Anita Sarkeesian, a feminist video game critic. She noticed me, and this happened. Right? If you Google my name on YouTube, you get shitheads like this dude who are making these dumbass videos. I had been sitting politely in the front row, and as you can imagine, abusing the audience from the stage is a violation of VidCon's rules. Oh. So I filed a complaint to VidCon. Uh, okay. Unless it's important to play the rest, I, I just want to get to my self-reflection because this guy's Okay, well, let me finish the story then with uh, the whole thing, what happened. And this was what we played the last show. We played uh, Ruben and uh, Peterson, who are both kind of, you know, it's, it's the problem, the real problem stems from the existence of Patreon uh, and the fact that this doesn't need to exist. People can do all the stuff that Patreon does themselves and their platform or whatever or it is, list of shows that you can subscribe to is not very, is not necessarily that convenient to the, anybody. But OK, what happened was now there's this huge boycott. Yes. Of, Patreon. of Patreon itself by everybody who sends them money for yes. anybody. And that hurts all creators. All the creators. And now they're getting all bent out of shape and they're calling in and bitching and moaning. And they're talking to apparently the the uh, Patreon the they yeah, they got some, no, some no, face. No, it's the uh, it's the it's the boss of the you know, the platform protection team, and I, yeah, I, I read woman, the I read the whole transcript. Warrior, yeah, I read the whole transcript. Yeah, oh, the transcript is funny, uh, and it's it's resulting in a lot of people that were making uh, I don't know, let's say they made ten thousand dollars a month. Now they're making six or five. They're make, they're just getting they're getting killed, and that's because of the reliance on one thing. Is it's a real? I think it's a. I think it was just a mistaken judgment to use these guys in the first place. But okay. But this is all because of these conferences that tell you to do this and these conferences that tell you to do that. And they're just the blind leading the blind, believe me. Oh, well, I think you're right that the, the conferences are incredibly unhelpful and they steer people in very traditional ways. There's no, no innovation. And after self-reflection, I understand what my issue is. I think I really had some hope coming from uh, a, a, a quite a career in mainstream broadcasting, radio and television, when when podcasting kind of organically grew. The, the, the biggest downside is that it exploded because of the iPod. I always found, found that to be a detractor. Uh, and, and, and I'd never named it podcasting. Danny Gregoire, as far as I'm concerned, named it that. And I think it's fantastic. It really helped a lot. But it always tied it to the iPod, and now we've moved beyond that. Um, but I had hoped that the, that people would see decentralizing as a way forward for the internet. And we've we've in fourteen, fifteen years, we're right back to in, I think ground zero because people are relying now on all of these corporate commercial places uh, for platforms where you don't need this. Now, do you get the algorithmic? Um, amplification that can explode you virally? No. But for most people, you don't even deserve to to have a, an actual audience of, of any size or, or make any money because you probably just make shit. I would prefer to see people using decentralized systems, building up core audiences who, we've proven it, will support you to the, to the degree that is necessary and valid and move forward. That We've got a, a lot of brain power, smart people, you know, I, Ruben and uh, Peterson, these are smart guys. They're arguing the fact that they don't see how idiotic it is 
what they're arguing about and how futile it is and how they will never win over this instead of promoting open source decentralized systems that are in play, even Bitbacker. You know, you, you can do payment systems with crypto and, and makes it simpler for people. I didn't think that's my frustration. It's just why are all these smart people, man, I get the platform, I am creating, get to work. I think that's my problem. I can see that that is your problem. You have a problem and that's it. Yeah. But this is not a new problem with you. No. But it's also, it doesn't, just because you have this problem doesn't mean that these issues aren't real for these people who have been, I would say, uh, it's like the, when they had the housing mortgage crisis and then that one guy on CNBC says, oh, well, these idiots that took out all these mortgages, screw them, <laughs> screw them. They, they deserve to go, go broke. These people that took out these mortgages during the housing crisis were advised to take out these yes. housing, uh, these mortgages. At they were advised yes, by yes, experts. At podcast conferences. They were advised by experts to do this. Oh, don't worry about it. You, you know, the price is going to go up. You're going to be able to pay for they were advised, and and then to, because they were, I wouldn't say they were stupid, because you get advised to do stuff you don't know anything about it. Well, yeah, you should maybe have to change your tires. Mm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it looks like then you need new tires. Well, okay, there's a lot of advice out there, and because it's bad advice, you're bent out of shape. No, it, no, I'm I I'm not. I'm just frustrated by. Over a decade of people doing the same stupid things and always being surprised when it doesn't work out or it works out in in a way that is not expected to them. I, I yeah, as smart people, it's the it's the mind. Well, it's, I, hmm. I I was taken aback when I saw Peterson and Ruben doing that video, uh, moaning and groaning about Patreon. Yeah, I think that's what pushed me over the edge. I'm like, holy crap! What are you what are you bitching about? Move on. You know, build up a simultaneous. You've got your YouTube and whatever you got, your Patreon. Start mirroring it somewhere else where it's just a lot harder to be kicked off and build up the audience. And guess what? You might actually help a lot of creators in in the process. Well, there you go. There's your <laughs> idealist, ladies and gentlemen. That is it. Yes. Uh, one person who was deplatformed, which did show up in the New York in the New York Times, uh, but was not discussed in the way I would have thought it was. Uh, this came out uh, what yeah was it yesterday twenty third yeah yesterday. Facebook has suspended Jonathan Morgan, the chief executive of a top social media research form firm, after reports that he and others engaged in an operation to spread disinformation during the special election in in Alabama last year. So the guy uh, who uh, runs the company that authored the report that is seen as the proof that the Russians suppressed 3 million black Americans from voting has now, now by Facebook's own standards, been accused of the exact same practice with the exact same amount of money, $100,000, and they've deplatformed him for it. But I guess everything's still valid with the report and we should not, we should just look the other way or just not talk about the report anymore. That's well. There's well. That's irony. That's great irony. That's I love fantastic. that. I love it. Uh, but this, I have a three part. I don't know what Facebook thinks it's doing, but they're just in panic mode. They must be having meetings. Hey, all wait, the time wait a minute. You stuff. said you said Facebook looked like a buy. Oh no, I didn't say it wasn't a bad. I did. I'm not talking about the stock. <laughs> you said it. It would never go away. There's no replacement. There isn't yet. USA Today. Um, this is really a horrible piece of video, and I, I fixed it as much as possible to get the, the, the interviewer's questions in. He talked to a couple of middle school kids about social networks, which one they use and what they like and what they feel about it. And here's his report from his USA Today website. To say that Facebook had a challenging 2018 would, of course, be an understatement with all the hacking, the apologies, and the hot water with politicians. How's that playing with the younger generation? They couldn't care. Uh, I know what he uses. Use it. That's kind of like, like, like an old people. Yeah. yeah, I feel like actually. I mean, like, oh, also, I know, I know you also, use it, but you like you're really young. But like, like <laughs> other old people, like no, like I know a lot of my friends have like Instagram, but I have no clue any of like my friends that use Facebook. Um, but I know like Snapchat, Twitter. Not like not a lot of Twitter, but mostly Snapchat and Instagram. But they never use Facebook. Is that because it's an old person's product? <laughs> <laughs> 
like, ignore it. They kind of like skip over that genre of social media. They're like, oh, Instagram, Snapchat, skip over Facebook. And they kind of just go on. So. How do you feel about hot privacy? That the phone knows everywhere you go. You're being tracked everywhere, you know, everywhere. It's creepy. That's, yeah, that's kind of scary me. for yeah. me. It's a setting where you can turn it off, but I feel like it's always watching you. Yeah, mm-hmm. like it has its yeah. eye of its own just staring at me when I'm on it. Yeah. Like even when I'm making weird faces. And then, like, I kind of think it's weird that they have screen recording now. So, like, it watches everything you do on the screen, but, like, if you wanted to. So I'm like... I love what these, you know, I have not read a report anywhere about this. I don't think they're wrong. These kids like, well, you know, you can uh, they have screen recording where they see everything you're doing on the screen. Hell yeah. But it's not one of the things discussed in Congress. But these kids seem to intuitively know what's happening. And there's, they go, yes, you can turn it off, but the eye is still watching me. I think that's from that idea. <laughs> I love Put it. Put a piece of tape over it. <laughs> parents being on the phone all the time. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, uh, my mom is on her phone 24 7 she's on it so much that um uh that she doesn't even want me looking at her activity it's yeah. gone to a point it's, yeah, to a point it's gone like to a point where it's like scary there you go there's the real issue <laughs> there's the children and it's influenced by the parents it's fantastic otg people hmm. well the kids aren't stupid no they're not they're not um, the UK government, uh, I think they, de- they already deployed this. They had facial, they were testing facial recognition in public or on the public and, um, around the, the Westminster area. This is, this facial recognition is, is really ha- happening a lot. The Amazon's doorbell, what is their door? They have a doorbell like ring, I guess. And, yeah, it's and, whatever it is. And now they're they're building in facial recognition, but it will, it will but it will also do facial recognition of people just on the street outside your door. They'll just will just keep doing that. Wow, <laughs> it's, uh... okay. Well, let's get back to politics. Really? Yeah, because that's all I got. Well, um... I do have some funny stuff though. I have Maxine Waters triggered. Have you seen this clip? No, probably not. Every day in every way. And the best way to do that is to stop talking about discrimination and start talking about the nation. We're coming together as a people in spite of what you say. Thank you, gentlemen. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Members are reminded to address their remarks to the chair, the uh, gentleman from Texas Reserves, the gentlelady from California. Thank you very much. Uh, The gentleman, Mr. Kelly, please do not leave uh, because I want you to know that I am more offended as an African-American woman than you will ever be. And this business about making America great again, it is your president that's dividing this country. And don't talk to me about the fact that we don't understand what happens on the autom- no, I will not lady? yield. No, I will not yield. Okay. I, I, don't I, tell I me that we don't understand. That's the, the general, attitude that's been given toward women suspend, time and time again. The general lady will suspend. The chair wishes to remind all members that they are to address their remarks to the chair. The general lady will continue. The chair, but don't stop me in the middle when you didn't stop him in the middle. <laughs> and so I shall continue. Wow. <laughs> don't you dare talk to me like that and think that somehow women don't understand what goes on on the floor of automobile dealers. Minded to direct her remarks to the chair. The general and lady will continue that in I order. I will continue to do that. However, I don't appreciate that you did not interrupt him when he was making those outrageous remarks about him knowing more about discrimination than I know about discrimination. I resent that and I resent the remark about making America great again. He's down here making a speech for this dishonorable president of the United States of America. Having said that, I reserve the balance of my time and no, I do not yield not one second to you. Not one second. Not one second to you. My time. My time. Ah, she is the gift that keeps on giving. She's the best. Hmm. I have another one. 
Well, actually, before 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 we do that, I'd just like to do a little quick uh, yellow vest update since that that. Oh yes, let's get back out of the country. Yeah. Well, well, yes, and and the reason is because no one is really reporting on it. In fact, the propaganda is now out. France's yellow vest protesters changed tactics on Saturday for the day of action in Paris. Builders Act Five of what have been violent confrontations in the capital. Initially, the capital was quiet as turnout was much lower. But then pop-up protests began, catching the police on the hop at the Louvre, around the statue of Jeanne d'Arc, or in Montmartre. No group numbered more than a few hundred. All streets remained open, and fewer shops were boarded up. (laughs) So the voiceover is actually saying there weren't as many people, it was a lot calmer, not as many shops were boarded up. And meanwhile, the video is showing people spraying cops with fire extinguishers, throwing electric scooters at them. It's nothing to worry about. Outside Paris, a planned demonstration at the Palace of Versailles attracted just a handful of demonstrators. It had been shut in advance for the day. This is the sixth straight week of protests and concessions made by President Macron appear to have taken the sting out of the movement, but it has cost lives. The latest a man in Perpignan whose car hit a lorry that had been stopped in the road by a picket line, bringing to ten the number of deaths, mostly in traffic accidents. So this is propaganda of the highest order from Euronews, because what really happened is that a lot of people who came from uh, outside Paris uh, in the first few weeks of these protests have now started these protests in their own towns and cities. This is this is spread all throughout France. Uh, the YouTube videos show everything. This and I see fear in these cops' eyes. Yeah, and and there's real beating going on back and forth. And just the funniest thing is when they're throwing the electric scooters at the cops. It's spreading. The Netherlands. We got a boots on the ground from Lucas Tayema that it's spreading to the Hague. Uh, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Emmen is not huge, but it's getting there. Portugal also uh, jumping in. Good morning. Uh, For the last two hours, uh, dozens of yellow vest protesters have been blocking, as you can see, the major accesses to the city of Porto. They managed to block the roads for some minutes. Uh, Then the police came and intervened and made them go away. But what they have been doing since then is to cross over and over the road in order to block the traffic. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting protest. So they just go to the pedestrian crossing, and they just keep crossing. <laughs> I'd never seen. It. I think it's a great idea. I'd never seen I it. I never thought of the idea. So you just do a circle. Just everyone's there's people crossing from left to right, from right to left, and then they just cross out about, and they go back uh, in the in the other direction, and it's very effective. Um, and well, I was, if you say if you got four, you got a four way stop thing. You can just go around in a kind keep of a, going. A, a square. Yeah. Keep walking. If you have enough people, you clog the whole thing up forever. In both directions. And th- it really is, it's impressive to me. It's, it, I don't know about the Portuguese, uh, uh, but the uh, the French just always impress me with, with what they're doing. And if cops, uh, the troll room pointed out, cops are pulling their guns. I mean, not rubber bullet guns, but like pulling their sidearms. You know, they, they feel that threatened. But the media is still, oh, don't. Pfft, it's all right. Macron fixed it. Everything's good. It's nothing to worry about. I wish we were like that in, in America. We only come it used out to be, but most of the laws have changed. You make it very difficult to get anything started. You can't have a general strike in the United States. It's, uh, the unions have fallen apart. They were corrupt. You know, too no, corrupt. We, no, we've been mind controlled. The only time we go out on the that. street is for a, a pink TV. a pink pussy hat. It's like, oh, okay, now we'll go in March. It's sad. Yeah, go Frenchies. But just looks like I think this is a much, much deeper, much broader than is being reported. It's hard to tell from what you can see on on YouTube, just the scale of it. But if you really read the reports, it's, so this is it's not diminishing, it's growing. It's just spreading out. Yeah, we're good at flash mobs. That's what we do in America. Hey, let's dance. <laughs> we're pissed off. We're gonna surprise dance on you. Yeah. So, you know, we've been accused of being a Trump apologist podcast. Oh, really? I've heard it. Hmm. It's bull crap, of course. But just to prove it, uh, I, I, I got a kick out of this uh, hate Trump medley 
Um, <laughs> have you heard this one? I don't know. Where is it? The Nobody Knows More. <laughs> Wait, is this about him, uh, about his big brain? I'm sure I'm sure that's something. Yeah, about his Nobody- big brain. <laughs> okay, where did you pick this up from? Who made it? You know, I don't know the source. It's just been floating around. Yeah, maybe super. I got one of those, too, that I'll play after this. Okay, let's listen. Nobody knows more than Trump medley. Nobody can do it like me. Nobody. Nobody can do it like me. Honestly. Nobody's stronger than me. Nobody has better toys than I do. There's nobody bigger or better at the military than I am. Nobody loves the Bible more than I do. (laughs) Nobody builds walls better than me. Nobody's better to people with disabilities than me. Nobody's fighting for the veterans like I'm fighting for the veterans. There's nobody that's done so much for equality as I have. There's nobody more pro-Israel than I am. There's nobody more conservative than me. There is nobody that respects women more than I do. Nobody would be tougher on ISIS than Donald Trump. There's nobody's ever had crowds like Trump has had. There's nobody that understands the horror of nuclear better than me. I mean, nobody even understands it but me. It's called devaluation. The sale of the uranium that nobody knows what it means. I know what it means. Nobody knows more about trade than me. Nobody knows the game better than I do. Nobody in the history of this country has ever known so much about infrastructure as Donald Trump. I know the H-1B. I know the H-2B. Nobody knows it better than me. Nobody knows politicians better than I do. Nobody knows more about taxes than I do. Nobody knows more about debt than I do. Nobody knows the system better than me, which is why I alone can fix it. (laughs) I'll tell you what, whatever he did, he became president doing it. I'll give him that much. I have a... um, I have the the counter to this. This is Rachel Maddow. Uh, someone put. The, I think it, this might be supercut. Someone put this. To, it's in the show notes. Someone put this together. This is one episode of Rachel Maddow. Just one episode. Russia. Russia. Vladimir Putin. Russia. 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 Russia hates Russia. 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 Putin. Russia's Russia. 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 Russian. 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 Russia. Russia. Moscow. Moscow. Russia. Russian. Pro Russian. Russian. Russia. Russian. 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 The Russians. Russian. 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 Russians. Russians. Russia. Russian. 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 Russia. Russian. 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 Moscow. Russian. Russian. Russia. Putin. Russian. 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 Against us. Russians. Russian. Russians rush against the U.S. The Russians rush, 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 Russian, Russian, Russian government scheme. The Russians, Vladimir Putin, Russia, Vladimir Putin, Russia, Putin, Putin and Russia, Russia, Moscow, Russia, Russian, Russian, Russia, the Russians, Russian, Russians, Russia, Russia, Russian, Russian, Russia, Russia, Putin, 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 Russian, 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 Russia, the Soviet Empire, the second of the 20th century's great evils, communism, Russia, communism, Russia, assault by Russia, 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 Putin despises the West in general and the United states in particular the soviet empire russia 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 they're the adversary they they want to bring us down the soviet union russia undermine the west soviet communist communists on the left russia that does it for us tonight we will see you again tomorrow Putin! i'm gonna show my support by donating to no agenda imagine all the people who could do that oh yeah that'd be fab Russia. <laughs> Russia, 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 Russia. <laughs> Michael asked Flack. We do have a few people to thank for show 1097. I want to thank him. Starting with my, Michael asked Falk. Falk. Uh, he's $121.71. Says he's actually in Berlin, Deutschland. Ah, oh, Deutschland. Here's the Hof. Yeah, so he says, Merry Christmas to us. Fröhliche Weihnachten. Uh, Sir Josh Mandel in Greenville, South Carolina. $111.11. Please keep me sane, or thanks for keeping me sane in 2018. Uh, David Corbanu, uh, parts unknown. David Corbanu, he's uh, oh. one of our end of show mixers. Oh, wait, he had a. Yeah, he actually did have a, a note that. Um, hmm. I'm going. It's, he had a long note, which I'm going to uh, move to the next program, but I will get to it, uh, Dave. Thank you very much, and certainly for the for the support of the show. Uh, Michael Supku, $100.13 from Belmar, New Jersey. He sent a note in that was something I felt I needed to put on my pile of stuff to read, which is or should be here. All right. Uh, greetings from the Jersey Shore. I'm requesting some home health karma for my 17-year-old niece who is being treated for neuroblastoma. Oh, that's in, crap. In New York City. It costs more for overnight parking in New York than to stay at the Ronald McDonald House. 
Kudos to Tina for being part of such a great organization. Yes. It, it, is, I, it is a great organization. I would give him the karma. I'm going to totally. You've got karma. And, and I want everyone to know that the local Ronald McDonald homes have to raise every dollar themselves. It's not like McDonald's you know, gives them. Of course, there's some corporate support. Uh, and I think one penny of every Happy Meal. And the local Oprah, uh, owner operators do a lot. But every Ronald McDonald house around the world has to stand on its own. And so anyone who supports them is, re- I think, really doing a service to your local community. In field 100, John Heineman or Heineman 100. Time to donate again. Uh, Sir Bradley Selsor in LaGrange, Kentucky. Uh, this is Merry Christmas from Dame Karen and Sir Bradley. Thank you. Uh, Sir Paul in Twickenham, Middlesex, UK. Uh, Sir Kevin McLaughlin, Viscount of Luna in Locust, North Carolina, 8008. Lee Scarbeck, 8008 in Springfield, Pennsylvania. These are all people wishing us a happy Christmas, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Daniel Sheets in Winchester, Virginia. Uh, Sir Rick, Arlington, Washington, 6996. Michael Greer in Hunlock Creek, Pennsylvania. Hey, yes, that's from uh, our uh, knight and dame in Pennsylvania. Mike I haven't, and Sarah, I haven't heard from him in a long time. Yes, Sir Michael. Good to hear from you. Uh, he's Merry in, Christmas. He claims he's in East Bumblefuck, Pennsylvania. That's where it is. That. Yes, I've been there. I've been, <laughs> I've been there to his house. <laughs> 6969, Baron Mark Tanner in Whittier, California. Um, was a Viscount now, I believe. At least. Uh, 6789, Brian Lawson, 6025. Yes. Craig Lee Frizzick in Loveland, California. He also sent a note in. Oh, just a, he sent a card. We're looking for more cards. Just says Merry Christmas. It was a nice card. Uh, Dan Pinkerton in Chula Vista, California. Oh, by the way, uh, Craig was 6006. Dan Pinkerton, 5225 in Chula Vista, California. He's got a birthday. 52nd, 52nd birthday, yeah. And Brian Lawson turned 60 on Christmas, or Brian. That's why he's also on the list. Brandon Fenton, 5225. Uh, says, Merry Christmas. Dude named Mohammed comes in at 5150. Merry uh, Christmas. Heard from him for a while. Yeah, yeah. Interfaith here on the No Agenda Show. Thank you. Rob Rabbi, Rob Sandlin, 51, loves the show. Andrew Benz, 5005 from Imperial, Missouri. Gregory Sisla, Sisla, 5001. Now, the following people are all $50 donors, name and location, if appropriate. And golly, there's only four. <laughs> I'm like, John is setting himself up for a short list. <laughs> yeah, what's the point? I like Greg- I like the bombastic nature of it. <laughs> yeah, Gregory LeBoy, Bath, Michigan. Uh, Sir Patrick Maycom in New York, New York. Uh, Alexa Delgado in Aptos, California, and Amy Burlingame. Parts unknown. Bless you. Short list made me sneeze. That's a short list, I'd say. Okay. Well, anyway, I want to thank all these folks for being associated. I'm uh, sorry, being ex- uh, producers for the show 1097. Uh, and if it wasn't for you people and the people who came in after you with lesser amounts, the great folk, uh, the show wouldn't be possible. And thank you for really showing through your really your peer review process that the value for value model works, is valid, and works for everybody. Uh, it's been going on, well, more than 10 years now I've been using this model, and we appreciate it. It keeps us going. It seems to keep a lot of people very happy. People get value out of the program in many different ways, and by supporting it financially, we get to do it every twice a week. So we will, of course, be back on uh, Thursday with our next episode. Also, thank you to everybody who came in uh, under $50. You're on our subscriptions, uh, or if you just want to be anonymous, that's another way you can do it. If you want to find out more about supporting the show financially in our value for value system, which means you determine what you think the show is worth to you, and you support it in that manner, go to... Dvorak.org slash (laughs) N-A. Just 
discombobulated. We got short 50 years. We got the short list for birthdays as well today. It is, of course, two days before Christmas, the 23rd of December, 2018. Happy birthday to Brian Lawson. He turned 60 on Christmas Day. And Dan Pinkerton will be 52 also on Christmas Day. Happy birthday from everybody here at the best podcast in the universe. It's your birthday. Not me, baby. Sin and I bring out here for me. 33. on our podcast tonight. That's right. We've got a couple of nightings for today, so I grab my blade if uh, you could bring yours out, John. Uh, wait a minute. Oh, man. You misplaced it? it? No, somebody came and cleaned up our office a little bit. Oh, here it is. I got it. Oh, thank goodness. All right, up on the podium, two nightings today. Greg Davies, step on up. David Nix and both of you have supported the No Agenda show in the amount of $1,000 or more. That gives you an automatic spot at the No Agenda roundtable of our knights and dames and all the lovely things that come associated with it. And right now, I'd like to pronounce the gate, you two guys, Sir Greg, the heavy metal historian, and Sir Dave of Lower Canada. For you gentlemen, we have hookers, blow, red boy. Chardonnay, cookies, vodka, cold brew coffee, cannabis. We got harlots and Haldol. We got redhead and rise, beers and blunts, Brazilian hotties and cachaça. We got Ruben S. Woman and rose. We got ginger ale and gerbils, bong hits and bourbon and mutton and mead. Both of you can pick up your ring or actually send your information to Eric the Shill by going to noagendanation.com slash rings. And uh, we'll get that out to you as soon as possible. And please tweet it out. I haven't seen any pictures of of night rings being tweeted. No, I have either. I'm very disappointed. Me tweeted out. So we'd love to see that whenever possible. And thank you again for supporting us. Dvorak.org slash NA all the way through the holidays without stopping. So I'm going to get you to pronounce this correctly. Kashasa. <laughs> Kashasa? Yeah. Oh, Kashasha. Oh, I thought you were talking about Kashogi. Kashasha? It's Kashasha. What did I say? Kashasa, not uh, Sha. Well, it's in my list that says Kashasa. So yeah, it's Kashasha. Well, it right, right there. Uh, Kashasa. All right. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Welcome. The Brazilians uh, always give you grief about that. Did you see this Malcolm? I, I miss this. This Malcolm Nance on uh, with Brian Williams on MSNBC about the Russian face bag disinformation campaign? No. Oh, my God. Well, what? Well, you, well, I want to play some clips from this guy. He just Ooh. he took it to such an incredible level that, it, okay. th- that I had no idea what was really going on in the United States, how far the Russians have come in. Oh, really? Yes. There's one outside now. Well, Malcolm Nance uh, with Brian Williams. Brian Williams, who... We know lied. He lied about a lot of things, and he was the 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 main guy at NBC News, and now he's uh, making millions. Now he's at MSNBC, and he gets through the break. He does the eleventh hour, which I kind of like actually. I'll, I'll watch it if I bump up into it. Uh, here's his intro to uh, Malcolm Nance with his creds. A new report out tonight reveals that Russian disinformation teams have targeted the special counsel. Oh. Two reports commissioned by the Senate Intelligence Committee and focused on the Internet Research Agents control farm Robert Mueller indicted last February. According to one of them, well, what is clear is that all of the messaging clearly sought to benefit the Republican Party and specifically Donald Trump. The goal was to reinforce tribalism, to polarize and divide, to exploit societal fractures, blur the lines between reality and fiction, erode our trust in media entities and the information environment, in government, in each other, and in democracy itself. The interference is still active and ongoing. And notably, the trolls have tried to create and amplify the narrative that the whole... Can you imagine, Brian Williams, if you'd asked him five years ago, do you think you will ever speak a sentence where you're talking about trolls? (laughs) And notably, the trolls have tried to create and amplify the narrative that the whole investigation was nonsense, that Comey and Mueller were corrupt, and that the emerging Russia stories were a weird conspiracy pushed by liberal crybabies. Who else? The online posts received nearly... 264 million engagements, engagements. As across platforms. That includes likes, retweets, shares. 
and whatever. So a bunch of bull crap. Right. Bull crap. All right. So he bring in Malcolm Nance. He's he's written a book about how the Russians uh, uh, crowned uh, King Donald. What Russia has done here, and where the true brilliance of this intelligence operation comes from, is way back in the early 2000s, the Russian military conducted a strategic study and started carrying out a disinformation plan in which they said that instead of carrying out kinetic warfare against your enemies, the best thing we can do is create a disinformation frame around that nation. <laughs> What's a a disinformation frame? I have no idea what he's talking about. I like what he's doing here. It goes back to 2000. I didn't, these Russians, man. To the point where over time, as we are constantly tearing them apart and feeding them with false information, they would actually welcome an invasion. <laughs> so Russia has done that to the Which? United States. Yeah. <laughs> So we're welcoming the Russians to march in the Red Army? Yes, eventually. I, maybe we're at that point. Maybe it's happened. Maybe that's what Trump is. He is the invasion. Come an invasion. So Russia has done that to the United States. And it began way before 2016. Oh. As a matter of fact, the earliest references I have uh, with relation to Donald Trump shows that it started back in 2011. With Maria Butina and the NRA contacts, contacts with the fundamentalist uh, Christian right and the alt right in the United States, Russia was pushing these disinformation themes. Then, then in 2013, they stood up the Russian Federation Internet Research Agency, which built all of these memes and tropes, which became tropes. the cruise missiles of fake news and disinformation designed to do what it did today take one-third of the United States population and make them refuse to believe what they see before their very eyes and may have elected a president in the process. Wow, I don't even know where to start to unpack that. It started in 2011. They had, they were, Is there they, some guy in a white coat and a butterfly net standing behind him? <laughs> Maybe in this last clip. The Russian Internet Research Agency was a subcontractor to Russian military intelligence and the FSB, Russia's uh, national security agency. And it was done at the cost of less than a couple of cruise missiles. They now own the mindset of one third of this nation. And by doing that, they have managed to now make us not believe anything that we believed before. That diversity was an American factor which made us greater. They have played on the, the themes of far right conspiracy theories from the 1960s. The John Birch Society, a, a sideline group, uh, you know, and the farthest extremes of the libertarian parties. Wait a minute. This guy is actually saying that the Russians looked at, looked at the landscape and said, if we can bring back the John Birch Society, people will go for it. They'll be all in. And they, a third of the country now believes what they the want John us to Birch believe. The John Birch Society, of course, being the most anti-Russian operation of its <laughs> era. It's the stupidest, okay. stupidest thing. makes sense. They have amplified racism to the point where the alt-right, Steve Bannon's own creation of gamers, is now the wholly owned subsidiary of the Trump campaign and our believers in David Duke, the Ku Klux Klan, Richard, and Richard Spencer, uh, the neo nazi and Robert what? Spencer, the Islamophobe, <laughs> to the point where they're mainstreamed. This is how effective this information warfare campaign has been carried out. And let me tell you, this report shows how they went after to suppress the African-American vote. And there is no doubt in my mind or anybody else's in the intelligence community that doesn't believe that it took American citizens to assist them ah. in really getting down to where these voters were who needed to be suppressed. And they did it in <laughs> such a fashion. One of their Twitter groups had 366,000 followers on it. Uh, Malcolm Nance, this is why we ask you all the time to come on this broadcast. Uh, scary stuff, but it for needs comedy? to be said, needs to be heard. Thank you, sir, so much for joining us. Needs to be heard? Scary stuff. <laughs> Let's play that again. <laughs> on it wow wow uh, malcolm nance this is why we ask you all the time to come on this broadcast uh scary stuff but it needs to be said needs to be heard thank you sir so much for joining scary us stuff. Yeah, scary, stuff. scary stuff baby it needs to be said needs to be heard thank you thank you for your courage malcolm nance what this a repressed african vote should be addressed 
let's say you're a, a African American and you didn't vote. Well, was it because you were repressed from voting you, no, or is it because you didn't want to vote? It's because you're so stupid you fell for the Russian propaganda. That's what's being said. It's it's a racist. It's, it's no, a racist. No. You're right. It's an insult to the black community. There are plenty of people that don't vote because they look at the candidates and say, I don't care. I'm not voting for either one of them. And so they don't vote. And that no, none of the blacks liked Hillary. They, it wasn't her husband. It wasn't Barack. They'd come out to vote for him. And they weren't coming out to vote. Some did come out to vote for Trump, but, you know, they were outliers. Yeah. So it's not some plot because otherwise they would have all poured into the voting booths to vote for Hillary. That's what the thesis is. That's what the underlying thinking is of that comment. It's exactly. Crap. It's racist. Uh, maybe because he's black, it can't be racist when he says it. Maybe that's okay. Oh, this know. guy's black? Yeah. N- Nancy, no, I would yeah. never guessed it. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yes. Scary stuff. This <laughs> needs to be said. That should be our scary thing. Stuff needs that should to be said. Okay, so the, that's the way it goes. You say, so if I say scary stuff, that's what you say needs to be said. Needs to be said. Okay, so let's try it again. Scary okay. stuff. Needs to be said. Yeah, good. We're on it. We can take the show on the road. Last time we hit it, yeah, we guarantee it. We can take the show on the road. So here is Gutierrez, grandstanding in Congress. Who's this? Gutierrez. This is Gutierrez. That he's the the radical uh, Latino uh, representative from Chicago, Mm -hmm. and he's always making a scene. He just hates everything. But the the kick I get out of this is, says, "I am not. I got forty five seconds. I'm not going to take my forty five seconds." And he takes a minute 20. Oh, okay. I saw this. Yeah, I saw this douchebag. All right. He's going after Bridget Nielsen. Not Bridget, Bridget <laughs> Nielsen. What am I thinking? He's going after Nielsen. Kirsten, the, the Kirsten Nielsen, woman. who, by the Kirsten. way, did not look good. Sorry, just as an executive producer mode for a second. She looked different. She didn't look good. She, it, something was wrong about her whole look in, during this, uh, this interrogation. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't see that. Yeah. I saw her as she looked like normal. No, person. there was something weird about her. I have to go back and look at it. I think maybe that she's changed her hair. Well, she's Ooh, on her way out. She's on her way out. She's done. She's so out. here we have the Gus- Guterres grandstanding, and then I got a second clip of her responding. And right in the middle of her response, he just walks out. He doesn't want to hear a word of it. He's a, This guy is the worst. I know I have 45 seconds. I won't take them all. 45 but it seconds. is repugnant to me and astonishing to me that during Christmas— Oh, wait. More context is needed because not everyone understands politics, American politics. This is Kristen Nielsen. She's the director of Homeland Security. She is in uh, overseas ICE, and she is responsible for anything that is done with immigration control and uh, uh, um, prosecu- uh, prosecution. No, uh, immigration uh, border immigration protection. Immigration border security. Yeah. Ripping children from mother's arms. That's what I meant to say. I know I have 45 seconds. I won't take them all. Bull crap. But it is repugnant to me and astonishing to me that during Christmas, I like to call them the holiday seasons to be inclusive, but during Christmas, because the majority always wants to just call it Christmas, that during Christmas, what's that got to do with it? A time in which we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, a Jesus Christ who had to flee for his life with Mary and Joseph. Thank God there wasn't a wall that stopped him from seeking refuge. In- I just, we can, it's too late, but maybe for next year we can do a new nativity scene with a wall. And, and them fleeing. Fleeing. <laughs> with Mary and Joseph. Thank God there wasn't a wall that stopped him from seeking refuge in Egypt. Thank God that wall wasn't there. And thank God there wasn't an administration like this or he would have too have perished on the 28th, on the day of innocence, when Herod ordered the murder of every child under two years of age. Maybe I haven't gone a lot to Bible school, but I know that part. <laughs> no, we're pretty sure you haven't gone to Bible school. <laughs> <laughs> thank God. Shame on everybody that separates children and allows them to stay at the other side of the border fearing death. Fearing hunger, fearing sickness, shame on us for wearing our badge of Christianity during Christmas and allow the secretary to come here and lie. Thank you. 
Time of the gentleman has expired. It's now, a couple things. One, how did he, if, if he had 45 seconds, how come they let him go for an extra 45? There's some seniority rule where you've been around long enough to kind of give you a little more leeway. Okay. And the second part of this, what he's talking about, I believe, is that um, the administration cut some deal with Mexico that all uh, people seeking asylum in the United States coming through the Mexican border, and I think he's probably talking more about Tijuana, um, that the Mexican government has agreed that they will house people and uh, while they're waiting for their asylum yeah, keep them on hearing. their side. Yeah, and and so is is Tijuana now such a horrible place? Because it sounds like sickness, and what did he say? He said a whole bunch of things about it. Yeah. It's, I don't have to bring hunger, yeah. bring sickness. Shame on us. So Tijuana, I mean, I don't, it doesn't seem like it's that bad. <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> right. All right, so. Yeah, okay. it was that bad in the 40s, maybe. I don't think it's that bad now. All right, so then she, she they throw it to her, and she's just kind of rolling her eyes. This guy's, you know, the guy's a lunatic. Yeah, I don't know how the Chicagoans can keep voting this clown in, but okay, let's listen to what she has to say. The secretary would care to respond to any of that. Only then to say that calling me a liar are fighting words. I'm not a liar. We've never had a policy for family separation. I'm happy to walk the gentleman through it again. A policy of family separation would mean that any family that I encountered in the interior, I would separate. It would mean that any family that I found at a port of entry, I would separate. It would mean that every single family that I found illegally crossing, we would separate. We did none of those. What we did do is uphold the laws that Congress has passed, and we prosecuted those who choose to come here illegally. As far as not being compassionate, let me just tell you what I have done. And, of course, he couldn't be bothered to stay, so I'm happy to tell the rest of the committee. <laughs> hey, he walked out. What an idiot. Oh, I find it annoying, these guys. These grandstanders. Kind of. Uh, there's a new spook that I, I don't know if she's been around or we just New missed. spook? Yeah, and there's a new Here's spook. We, we don't have a new spook jingle. Um, I'm going to see what her name was now. Her name is... Samantha v- Vinograd, and she's another um, fast truck. Spell her last name. I'll look her up. Victor India November Oscar Golf Romeo Alpha Delta. Uh, do it in letters. We're not. We, we're not on a CB. Don't you ever call me a CB or again. Vinograd. V i n o g r a d. You know, it's interesting. Uh, Samantha, because you, you, you've spent a lot of time in the Middle East. You understand walls that work, walls that don't work. Let me put that tweet that the president just posted uh, when he says the steel slat barrier. There you see the steel fence, in effect, that the president wants to build. But you know how uh, individuals, if they want to get into the United States from Mexico, get around a fence, uh, a steel slat barrier like this? Well, first of all, there's spikes at the top of this fence. I feel like the president Googled Middle Ages and tweeted something out rather than consulting with actual security experts or architects about what could work in this kind of scenario. I was in Ramullah and I saw the wall uh, in the Palestinian territories between the Palestinian territories and Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu reportedly spoke with the president earlier this week and said, build a wall. It'll help. Well, guess what terrorists and uh, other illegal immigrants in the Middle East do? They build tunnels under walls. Those spikes don't deter that kind of activity. And I just want to point out, the president's own State Department doesn't even think that this wall is, or steel slats is going to solve the problem of illegal immigration. On Monday, they issued a whole strategy for combating illegal immigration that has nothing to do with the wall. And some of those very same employees will be furloughed if this government furloughed? is shut down. <laughs> furloughed. Furloughed. <laughs> Don't furlough me, bro. Build the wall. All right, I remember now. She okay. went, yeah, go ahead. She spooked. She looks like a spook. Well, here, I'm going to just read off a few things and you tell me. All right. She's got an MA in studies from Georgetown. She worked for the U.S. Department of the Treasury in Baghdad, and then in various positions for the administration of Obama, where she worked at the National Security Council as the director for <laughs> Iraq, yes. director for International Economic, senior advisor to the National Security Advisor, uh-huh. and then in 2013 went to work for Goldman Sachs, <laughs> focusing on public-private sector partnerships. A spot the spook, spot the yeah. spook. Everybody wants to spot the spook. Now, 
there was a thought going around, a rumor, like an idea that you remember when they had the the the, the caravan come rushing up. You know, they're charging us yes. from Guatemala. Yes. And a lot of them went to the Texas side and a lot, most of them went to Tijuana, toward right. Tijuana. Yes. And it was Mattis who was told, there's another reason they got, maybe got rid of him. He was told to send some troops down there. He didn't want to do it. Send some troops down there. And it's rumored that the reason he sent the troops to Texas instead of where the action was, which is Tijuana, was because there's something like, suppo- supposedly, 3,000 tunnels underneath the walls and barriers in Texas where these guys are sneaking in. Mm-hmm. And the idea was, to, is there, there was some code or something that came out that said, we're going to storm the country through these tunnels. And so the army, we had to be there to keep that from happening. Uh, don't know anything about it more than that, but there's a, I, I agree that the, most of the action of the uh, cocaine and the rest of it is all through tunnels. And they build their tunnel builders, digging, digging, digging. Right. You know, that fence isn't going to do anything about that. You know, I was reading the uh, the newish, the newer book of, from uh, Since I Got the Soap. I picked up the book again, uh, Theodore Kaczynski. It's called The Anti-Technology Revolution. Uh, and it, it's his version of how we should combat the technology. Um, yeah, just combat technology in general. And he talks again there about the unintended consequences of technology. I call a wall or slatted fence or whatever you want to call it is, of course, a version of technology. And it, you know, and we have no idea. Trump doesn't know. No one knows. I think the tunnels, yeah, that could happen. A, a, a whole bunch of other things could happen because of this wall that we do not know about. So it's not quite as black and white as everyone sees it. And I agree. I think the tunnels is actually a pretty, you know, yeah. I think tunnels in our future. Tunnels. <laughs> Don't you think so? Yeah, tunnels. Tunnels are in our future. Well, it's, a, it's in our future with Elon Musk and his tunnel. Yeah, the more I, th- the more I think about having a tunnel in Los Angeles, the stupider I think it is. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> no, it's not fine. Apparently, they have trouble because the, the Angelinos are so freaked out about earthquakes, and there's a big one coming, that they, they're not using the subway. They built a big subway system in L.A., which runs all over the place. It's, it's not like New York or Chicago even or anything uh, like in Europe or even Russia, but it's there. Mm-hmm. And uh, b- b- the Angelinos won't go, you know, they, no, 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 I don't want to be in that thing when the whole thing collapses. Right. They're like freaked out. I mean, even in the Bay Area where we have the same problem, I mean, we, we go under the – I'm always – in fact, the kids, we talk about this. When you're in the BART, which is our subway elevated – and when you go under the under the bay to get to uh, San Francisco, everybody kind of holds their breath for the seven minutes it takes. Uh, <laughs> I can imagine why. <laughs> you know, but it's packed with people, and they go when they do it. But I don't know what the point of the LA one is. It just doesn't seem to have uh, any real rhyme or reason. I haven't been on it. Have you? No. No. I'd like to go on it. I once. tend to just stay home and, and, and yell at the chemtrails. Yeah, well, that would be, yeah, that's something. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what I do. Yell at the chemtrails. I stopped yelling at Fox News. I just yell at the chemtrails now. <clears throat> uh, we have uh, quite the medley. We have one, two, three, four Christmas songs that uh, we're going to share with you. Uh, thanks to Secret Agent Paul. Uh, thanks to uh, Sir Chris Wilson. And actually, I'm going to carry a couple of them over because it's just it's too much. Uh, that is the non uh, the non Christmas related ones. Oh yes. So we appreciate that. Thank you all very much. Merry Christmas, everybody, and we'll talk to you just before the New Year's. Uh, that'll be on Thursday and Sunday and Sunday. And coming to you from downtown Austin, Texas, capital of the Drone Star State, FEMA region number six on the governmental maps in the 5 by 9 Cludio in the common law condo. In the morning, everybody, I'm Adam Curry. And from northern Silicon Valley, where I have to say, for people who read the newsletter, that it turns out it may have been a meteor, and that was some upper-level disturbances that created that screwy uh, pattern. No, 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 no. Just, you're wrong. It was a studio light, obviously. I'm John C. Dvorak. Talk to you on uh, Thursday. Adios, mofos!
better not cry, you better not speak, you better black up, we need a black peep. Santa class is coming to town. He's making a list, he's filling his bag, he's gonna find out who's been a douchebag. Santa class is coming to town. He knows what you've been searching, he looks at you with scorn. He knows your browser history and collection of goat porn. You better wake up, you better download the latest No Agenda episode. Santa class is coming, Santa class is coming, Santa class is coming to town. Donate to No Agenda, donate to No Agenda, donate to No Agenda for a happy new year. We'll reach a note and play your jingles, reach a note and play your jingles, reach a note and play your jingles for 200 or more. Go karma we bring to you and your kid. Donate to No Agenda for a happy new year. That's right. Your No Agenda show is 100% supported by listener donations. So, if you want to prevent anal leakage and keep your amygdala small, firm and round, donate to No Agenda. Your service code will thank you. Felix? Do they celebrate Christmas on No Agenda? No, they're podcasters. They're too poor to celebrate Christmas. Can we make a jingle for Adam and John? What would you like to make the jingle about? Donald Trump. That's a good idea. Get ready to shout. Get ready to cry. Get ready to pout. I'm telling you why. Donald Trump is coming to town. Better resist. Get into a fight. You're gonna take on the fascist old right. Donald, Donald Trump, Trump is, is coming to town. town. He's literally Hitler. We know he's full of hate. But Daddy is the president. He'll make America great. You'd better mask up, you need to organize It's time for a lap, I'm telling you why Donald, Donald Trump, Trump is, is coming, coming to town Daddy, what's the difference between Santa and Donald Trump? I don't know Santa's good for bells and Donald Trump's good for jingles Donald, Donald Trump, Trump is, is coming, coming to town, town. Get the anti the flag Start flying it high Set fire to shit Punch the man and my guys Donald, Donald Trump, Trump is, is coming to town. town We know he's pure evil We know he's Putin's mate We all know Max and Waters would punch him in the 
face. Yet the Antifa flags start flying, flying it high. high. Set fire to shit, punch Man random white, white guys. Donald, Donald Trump, Trump is, is coming to town. Donald Trump is coming to town. Please don't eat me, Donald Trump. Are we done? Mofo. Dvorak.org slash N-A Merry Christmas, slave.